This is Jocko Podcast number 171 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and that I will obey the orders of the President of the United States and the orders of the officers appointed over me, according to the regulations and the Uniform Code of Military Justice. So help me God. And that is the oath of enlistment that is made by every US military member. And the other day I was at a charity event for America's Mighty Warriors, which is an organization that was created by Mrs. Debbie Mama Lee, the mother of Mark Lee from Task Unit Bruiser who was the first SEAL killed in action in Iraq. And it was a great event and it was an honor to be there, and I spent some time answering questions from some of the people that had come out to the event, and one of the individuals asked a question about the fact that he had served in the Marines during the 90s, during a time of peace, and he didn't go into combat, and he didn't go to war, and he actually felt guilty about that. He felt that he hadn't done enough and I told him the truth and the truth is that he had done what his country had asked him to do that's what he'd done and if the country had needed him to give more then he would have given more that is what the oath of enlistment is and it's one of if not the most powerful oath that a person can give because when you take that oath if you take that oath you are putting your country above all else. Above your family, above your future, above your life, above yourself. And with that oath, when you take that oath, if your country needs you to sacrifice, you will sacrifice. And if the country needs your time, you will give it your time. And if it needs even more than that, then you will give it even more. And the good soldier, sailor, airman, or marine, the service men and women who defend this nation, they will sacrifice and they will give until they have nothing left. And it is my honor tonight to have someone on the podcast that has sacrificed incredibly for our great nation, and yet his attitude remains completely unwavering. He drives on and sets an example for everyone, an example of pure fortitude and tenacity and one that fully represents the motto of the hollowed brotherhood he will always be a part of and that's the United States Marine Corps and their proud Maxim Semper Fidelis always faithful been working to make this podcast happen for a long time and tonight I am grateful to have this hero with us a man by the name of Matthew Bradford Matt welcome to the show thanks for having me on Jocko this is uh it's something else to be set in front of you right now because there's been a lot of remarkable people that's been on this podcast and it's a true honor to be here in front of you and Echo and get the chance to meet you all. Yeah, and I know we've been working on making this happen for a while, so I'm glad we finally were able to get you and your family on a plane, flown out here where we can where we can sit down and talk for a little bit and then you can get back with your family and go have some good times. Go swim in the pool and spend spend the week at the happiest place on earth. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. And it sounds like you're going to have good temperatures. I'll give you a little heads up. It can be a little warm here in Anaheim if you're not careful. If you come out here in the summertime, you uh, you'll you'll get baked out there in the in the in the in the Disneyland. 
<laughs> my, my pasty white skin and I'm hard headed, so I don't like putting sunscreen on. So I learned the hard way. Yeah. Well, hopefully you guys will be all right. Um, all right. So let's just go. Let's go to the beginning. Growing up, what that was like growing up in, in Kentucky and Virginia. What was that all about? Yeah, I was, a, I was born in Petersburg, Virginia. Where my dad, he worked at Fort Lee at the Defense Commissary Agency. And, you know, at an early age, my parents got a divorce. So I moved to live with my mom in Kentucky, where all of my family's from. And even today, when people ask me where I'm from, Kentucky is just the easiest answer. And, you know, throughout my childhood, like we moved so much. I learned a lot because my mom, she worked paycheck to paycheck. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I learned a lot about you know, how to appreciate things and to be thankful for things and not expect the bigger things. And, um, you know, through this, I I learned to just go outside and be with my friends and never expect, you know, a big Christmas or, but I knew one thing from, from my mom and from my stepdad and even my family around me, the one thing they showed me and the rest of us was love. And it, it taught me a lot about life at an early age. And, you know, it's, it's through all the moving around, but you know, in Kentucky, the one thing with Kentucky is they they have a lot of um, their drug problems. Mm-hmm. So it's uh, getting out and playing sports and getting away from that helped out a lot. And, you know, all of this happened in 2001. And that's when I realized as a ninth grade and as a freshman in high school is when I felt like it was my purpose to serve this country in the military, even though I was a freshman in high school. Sitting there watching, you know, the, the, the terrorist attacks go on in New York City and the Pentagon and I felt like it was my time to go home and nobody was on the streets. Nobody was playing basketball or football or whatever the sport of the, the time was. Everybody was inside watching the news. And also through that, you know, my my mom and my stepdad was going through some things as, as their own. And and uh, that's when, thankfully, my dad stepped in. And my dad said, you're coming to live with me now. And that was the greatest decision ever because although I love Kentucky – I don't know where I'd be at the day if, if, if my dad didn't step in and, you know, pull me towards him in Virginia. And moving to Virginia after my freshman year in high school and, and staying there for three years, you know, living right next to an Army base and visiting the Army base daily, I got the chance to see what, what, um, what the, the willingness to serve, you know, the patriotism and all this stuff. And it really kind of boosted my, um, my motive to serve more and more. So when you were when you were in Kentucky and you were a freshman, had you thought about the military prior to September 11th? Growing up in Kentucky, the only thing that I wanted to do was play basketball for the University of Kentucky. <laughs> that was, I mean, that's the one thing. And um, you know, you'd go out on the street or you'd play video games, which then was the old school PlayStation, and you just wanted to play basketball for Kentucky. There was nothing else. And um, 2001 happened, and that's when kind of like the, it got in my mind. That's what I wanted to do. And then during that time, Black Hawk Down come out as the movie, and mm-hmm. and I just watched that over and over again. And I was like, I want to be a ranger. I want to serve, you know. And and then it went from the army to I looked into the Air Force Special Forces, and their their Special Forces was way too long because I wanted to deploy. And I actually ran into the Marine Corps recruiter at Fort Lee playing basketball, and he took us to Hooters. <laughs> and that's where he sold me was at Hooters and <laughs> oh that's uh that's good I guess it doesn't it doesn't take you know for me when when the Marine Corps recruiting is awesome and I I, I heard this fact a long time ago that the Marine Corps spends the least amount of money on recruiting but has the the best results because they just have their well, they have the Marine Corps. They have the the Marine Corps persona behind them the the legend of the Marine Corps and that I remember, you know, when I was a kid, there was a guy that I knew that was a drill instructor and he would, he was older than me, but you know, occasionally he'd come home and I would just think, well, obviously that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> I mean, there's no doubt in your mind, you know, you just see these human beings that are above and beyond anything you've ever really seen before and you go, that's, you know, when you're 10 years old and you see a Marine Corps drill instructor, that's a that's a damn impressive sight man. <laughs> that is an impressive sight especially when you see the dress blues walk into the cafeteria at school and with all the medals and the ribbons and it's like this is what i want it to be and and because growing up like on my mom's side my grandpa served and and then on my dad's side a lot of his family a lot of that family served in the military and i never realized the military was you know in my future but looking back on it now because i've been asked this question if you've ever if you just think it's you know was 
set up for you to join the military and as as many people in my family that served i kind of you know to answer the question now i thought it was my time to serve and but i mean just the, the marine corps alone it's you know it wasn't my first choice because i just wanted to serve but i tell you what it's, it's it was the greatest decision I ever made in my life as an 18 year old you know um, december of my senior year in high school going to the mep station and you know taking that that oath and getting the date to go to boot camp to recruit training and all i had to do was just give my recruiter my diploma and then get on a bus and there i go and I, surprisingly the first day of school the next year is when i was on a bus stepping on those yellow mm-hmm. footprints and getting screamed at so, so you decided you were going to join after september 11th and that was your freshman year then you go from kentucky to virginia and but you're are you focused the whole time now you're just saying yep i'm going in the military as soon as i get done with high school that's that's where your mindset was that was i was a. Uh, I, I, my grades were bare minimum to average just to stay on a sports team and because all I knew was to my recruiter needed my diploma that was it and believe me there were some classes that I struggled with and I didn't know if I was going to give him that diploma or not but mainly English second semester of my senior year that was a but it was a it was my mindset that's what I wanted to do I didn't think anything about going to college I just wanted to serve in the military yeah that's uh, there's something I don't know. You know, I got I got a bunch of teenage kids. I got uh, two daughters and one son that are teenagers all right now, and then I got a little girl. But for kids these days, a lot of them are programmed that what you do when you get done with high school is you go to college, mm-hmm. and this that's not for everybody. It really isn't. And for me, it certainly wasn't. It's something I wanted to do. I was like, oh, I I, sh- I wish I could have joined the military when I was like thirteen, because because I would have just been such a much better person you know so all right you you struggle a little bit in school in english apparently Uh, definitely (laughs) what sports did you play i played football i played basketball a little bit and i pretty much played all sports um not for school related but little league baseball and then my wife likes to make fun of me but i played high school tennis from sophomore to senior year and i will um I went out there the first practice, my buddy that kind of like recruited me to come play. And the coach was like, hey, how about you two just go down there and play a bunch of sophomores, just kind of get it out of our way. Mm-hmm. And I beat him eight nothing. He got so mad. <laughs> it was so funny. And like walking or walking or down, you know, um, walking back to the other side of the courts and hearing the other players was like, oh my gosh, he just beat him eight nothing. And the guy had red hair and his face was just as red as his hair. <laughs> and, um, but you know, like, I, 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 junior year, I, I was the one seed on both singles and doubles and went pretty far in the district. Dang. And, uh, you know, senior year was the same. And it was just something that I enjoyed to do in the springtime. It was a, uh, and honestly, it's very, you run so much that you, you, you got to be athletic and you got to be in shape. And that helped out a lot too, you know, with football in the fall and then uh, tennis in the spring. And then, and so what year did you graduate? 2005. And then you left in September of 2005, you leave for boot camp. I did. Yep. Graduated in June and left in September. So a couple of months in between. And, and that's the, the one thing, like in high school, I, there was a, a couple of Marines or a couple of guys that I graduated with. We graduated on Friday and they went to boot camp on Monday. And <laughs> they're the ones that kind of like, kind of helped me kind of really realize that the Marine Corps is what I wanted to do, even though it's kind of what I was focused on. But when did you when did you sign a contract at MEPS? December of uh, two thousand four. Okay, so you had a little delayed entry. Mm, delayed entry program. Everyone else is worried about what they're going to do after high school, and you're like, I'm going to party all summer long, <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm going to Marine Corps boot camp. How much of a shock to your system was it when you got to Marine Corps boot camp? It, the first three days was, I mean, it's it it was just so much. Like you know, of course, you don't sleep at all, and it's just this constant yelling and you're realizing like what in the world did I do because you can only watch it on videos and understand it's like okay that's on a tv screen and that's not real life but it was something else getting you know I guess they arrange it up every every time the bus goes through Paris Island that they're going to stand on the yellow footprints in the middle of the night and of course that's when we got off and I was it was a 12 passenger van and I was kind of in the middle seat and I had to go through the seatbelt to get out while I'm getting yelled at. So I'm like choking myself with the seatbelt. And, you know, we get to the yellow footprints and it's like, 
you're standing there in you know position of attention and it's like your calves start tightening up and you start just you're like oh my gosh what did i do why yeah. did i sign this paperwork and <laughs> I think the funniest thing was when we actually went on to Paris Island, how this this van from Virginia down to Paris Island, eight hours of just joking, talking. The minute we passed the gate, it just got silent. Like, <laughs> Stand by. And there was, you know, and then, you know, going back, like when I, because I turned 18 my senior year in August, and I did a late entry program, or I, I you know, went to MEPS December, and when I would come home in December and my dad was like, so what'd you do? And I was like, I, I, I signed up for infantry in the Marine Corps. And he was like, you know what infantry does, right? And it's like, I do. And and this is the time, like in my room, I had the big Marine Corps poster with the three Marines in their dress blues. I think it was the guy and the, the female. And, yeah. and it was like, it took up the whole wall. And I was, I was dedicated to the Corps then. And I was so excited to to raise my hand and then go to school the next day wearing my MEPS Marine Corps t-shirt. I was, <laughs> I was like, this is it. The I'm perfect you know, recruit. Yeah. You know, I started walking around with all the Marine Corps shirts. I'd go to the mall and I'd walk around with my shoulders all cocked back. It's like, this is it. Yeah. That's awesome. I was trying to, cause uh, there's been quite a few people that have joined the military from listening to the podcast. And now, whenever I talk about this, I always try and tell them that for at least the first two weeks, they're going to hate me. They're going to hate the military. They're going to hate boot camp. It's going to seem like the worst decision they ever made. I was uh, I actually was speaking on the USS George Washington in Japan in 2009. And this, this sailor walked up to me. He's like, oh, I just got off the phone with my dad and tell him I'm reading, listening after hearing you speak. And I'm like, oh, gosh, you didn't give me my name, did you? <laughs> it's like, but <laughs> Yeah, check. So... Uh, you go through boot camp, and you get done. You, and you knew you were going infantry the whole time, right? I did. I That's knew awesome. I was infantry, and you know, in two thousand five, like I feel like we had about seventy seventy five recruits in our platoon, and the majority of them were going to infantry. And the funny thing is, sitting in our squad bay, and our senior drill instructor, he was he was sitting in front of us, talking to us up on the quarter deck, and. He's like, I got one more class after you all, and then once I'm once I'm done, I'm going to Hawaii, and I'll never see you little, <laughs> you little pukes again. And and you kind of just like blow that off. It's like, okay, cool. He's going to Hawaii. I'm more than likely an East Coast Marine, so I'm going to stay at Camp Lejeune and do my time there, and hopefully never run into him. But then you experience the small Marine Corps gets a lot smaller. <laughs> and um, you know, once we got the SOI, graduated from there, and. And they, they told us that a select few of us from Alpha Company, School of Infantry, would be going to Hawaii, be stationed with 2nd Battalion, 3rd Marines. And a select few of us was our whole company and the company next, the Bravo Company. Dang. So they they dropped us off in Hawaii. And you go through there. and Is that normal for like a whole company from SOI to go together to a battalion somewhere? I didn't think so. I, th- I thought, you know, you know, in the Marine Corps, it's like east of the Mississippi, you're pretty much going to stay all together. But I thought they would kind of disperse you out through different battalions, and um, thankfully, everybody like a lot of the guys that I went to boot camp with was in the same battalion as me in Hawaii. So, like I created that friendship and that brotherhood from the start of the Marine Corps, mm-hmm. and carried it with me along the way. And and I, I was glad because you know it's growing up in Kentucky and Virginia, I didn't want to be stationed in Lejeune or the East Coast. And yeah. you know I, they gave me this little wish list, which I don't think they even look at it. I think they just give it to you because it's a check in the box. But <laughs> make so I, you feel good. Yeah, I picked I picked Okinawa and Camp Pendleton as my first two choices, and they pretty much put me right in the middle in Hawaii. <laughs> Split and, the difference. Yeah, so I always tell people a free government trip to Hawaii. I mean, I can't complain about that at all. So, uh, how was the school of in- infantry? It was cold in North Carolina. We were during that time. There were so many guys going through the through infantry school and. A lot of guys were just like there for a couple of months, three months. And, um, you know, like you go to the chat hall and you got a, like a 10 to 20, um, like a snake line of rows and rows of Marines going, just trying to eat chow. And I was so close to actually call my recruiter to go on recruiter assistance because I didn't know how much longer I'd be here. And thankfully, my last name starts with a B. And so, so January, I got selected and put an alpha company and the first three weeks is just kind of learning the whole weapon systems and working on, you know, going on humps and stuff. And, and then the, the next three weeks was basically out in the field the whole time doing infantry work and clear, you know, learn how to clear rooms and do a lot of mount training. And, and at this point, you're 
did you guys all pretty much assume you're going to Iraq or Afghanistan 100%? I mean, being an infantryman in the Marine Corps, there's a war in two countries. You, you must have all just realized you're 100% going. Pretty much. And, and that's the reason why I wanted to choose infantry, because I wanted to deploy it as quickly as I possibly could. And, uh, you know, two of my drill instructors were Purple Heart recipients from the Battle of Fallujah. And um, so it's like you kind of you kind of hear it from all the drill instructors when you're going through recruit training that, you know, this is where you're going to end up. You know, you go through your school and you go through your training, but more than likely, 99 percent of you are going to Iraq or Afghanistan. Were you thinking about that? Like you're on the range, you're dialing in your weapon. Are you thinking to yourself, I better pay attention right now because I might be needing this skill in a couple months when I'm overseas? I don't think it ever like crossed my mind because I just did what I was told to do, mm-hmm. you know, and, you know, when it was on the rifle range or if it was like patrolling, you know, I tried to take in as much as I possibly could and learn as I went. And, you know, the, the more I learned, I just, you know, I learned to uh, not only teach myself, but also teach those around me and stuff because I, I didn't, you know, you, you only see it on the news. You don't really know what to experience. And it's it's funny because I tried to read the book, No True Glory. Yep. And and I couldn't really understand what Iraq was like, you know, from clearing rooms or patrolling down the streets, urban terrain. I couldn't understand that because I wasn't there. And, you know, of course, now when I read these books, I understand because I, I can visualize it in my head. But, you know, then I was just doing what I was told and I was um, learning as I went along. And... I, you know, I learned what I could through School of Infantry, and then once I got to the fleet, it kind of changed a lot because we just had to learn what the what our battalion and and our squad and platoons was doing there. At the School of Infantry, did you do company sized operations of bit like cl- clearances of villages and stuff like that? We we did towards the end of School of Infantry. We had um, we had all the Elevens out there, and then we had the machine gunners and the mortarmen would set up, and and we kind of. Um, we would we would humvee in and you know we'd go in and clear a couple of homes and stuff like that and but it was more of a company level Mm -hmm. it's hard it's hard to remember back then but it was because it was the the one thing in like north carolina like where we were at training for a school of infantry it was just a lot of like machine gun fields and a lot of like pop-up targets Mm -hmm. and those kind of ranges and then the mount town wasn't as extensive as it was once we got to the fleet and went to cax in california So there, so you would say at School of Infantry, you are more working on your individual infantry skills more than like working together with a platoon or a company sized elements. I think so, because a lot of times at School of Infantry, we did a lot of fire team stuff. Okay. And, um, you know, we did a lot of hikes every every Thursday once we got back from the field. But a lot of it was like just learning weapons, learning how to shoot at pop up targets and like moving targets and just kind of. um you know, like learn just kind of learn the whole weapons weapons and systems and stuff every marine is first and foremost a oh. rifleman <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> and, that, and that's where you become a rifleman okay so now you get assigned to two three marines and you're you're heading off to hawaii which is we're just coming from coming from kentucky and then virginia and then north carolina and now all of a sudden you wake up and you're in hawaii we were actually in the squad bay me a, a guy from Georgia and the other guy from Tennessee and we were listening to Craig Morgan's Redneck Yacht Club thinking this is what we're going to do when we get to Hawaii and of course all, I think all three of us were in different companies so we never saw each other once we got to Hawaii but you, you like you fly in and you get there and it's like oh my gosh we're in Hawaii and we we get on the bus we get all our gear and we get dropped off at the battalion office and we got you know two of my seniors waiting on me and he's like they're basically like pulling me to the barracks just so it's like, you're all ours now. It's like, oh gosh. <laughs> and then, you know, you start hearing stories from like other, the, the, the other guys that, you know, got there with me and how their, their seniors are, um, you know, welcoming them into the, the, the platoon. <laughs> what, what, what month did you get there? Uh, March, March of 2006. Okay. And so the, the, as soon as you get there, so and those guys were just coming back from Afghanistan, right? They were. They they were actually over there during Operation Red Wing. Yeah. And um, yeah, they were. I think they got back February of two thousand six. So they were just getting back from their post deployment leave, and um, you know, once once we got there, it was pretty much you got to get right into another workup. And and then that workup is where you really start 
integrating everyone together, working in platoon size elements, working in company size elements? It was. And then that's when we kind of, they told us when we first got there, everything you learned in school of infantry, just like lose it. <laughs> because now you're going to learn what we teach you. And, yeah. you know, from everything from just like clearing conference rooms and barracks rooms to, you know, working on patrolling up the streets in Hawaii. And that was the one bad thing about being stationed in Hawaii. That's It's a great place to be stationed, but there wasn't much to do any training. And we would, um, I mean, we would literally patrol up and down the streets at K-Bay, Kaneohe Bay, uh-huh. Hawaii. And they had a couple of old barracks that we'd work mounts. Uh, you know, we'd do mount training with and with sim rounds. And, um, you know, we'd, do, we'd go to Bellows, which was like a little Air Force base that they were starting to create like a mount town. And that's when we did a lot of our training and kind of our field work. And now at this point, are you starting to think, and you got guys that are just coming back from Afghanistan, are you starting to think like, okay, now I really need to start paying attention? The reason I'm asking you these questions is because I'm trying to relate. You know, when I joined the Navy, it was 1990. There was like, I guess the Gulf War was kind of on the horizon, but it, and it was gone so quick that by the time I was in Buds, it was over. Mm-hmm. And so even when I was doing workups and stuff, like I would always be thinking like, okay, I need to be good at this because someday I might need this skill. But that's a big stretch. You know what I mean? Whereas once September 11th happened, every one of these young guys that was coming in, it was like, oh, I'm probably, it wasn't like someday I might need this skill. It was like, I'm probably going to need this skill in the next couple months to save my life or my friends' lives. Did you feel like that kind of intensity from yourself and from the other guys that were just coming back from overseas? I think so, because I feel like the way they were kind of instructing us and teaching us this stuff and... They kept relaying that any minute now that we could be called up and deploy. And you start getting more serious about it. And I think my attitude changed. And it wasn't more of like joking around, even though I like to joke a lot. But it was when it's time to be serious, it's time to be serious and it's time to learn. You know, and, you know, whatever weapons I was carrying around, if it's a saw or the, 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 um, the rifle, the M16, you need to learn everything about that and you need to learn it to its T. And I think that's the one thing that I really paid more attention about. And, and it's, um, but it was just like, you could feel it from your seniors because they, they experienced like casualties, they experienced deaths over in Afghanistan. They knew what combat was like. And you started understanding that this is serious now. This ain't, a, you know, this ain't a video game or a joke. You're getting ready to go to war in you know, five, six, seven months, or even tomorrow, you never know. And so everything that you need to learn here is something that you need to take serious because this is, you could be, have yourself in this situation when you're in combat. At what point did you know where you were deploying to, that you were deploying to Iraq? I feel like it was after CACS in July. We were in, we were in CACS from June to July of 2006, which is great months to be in the deserts in California. <laughs> but I feel like once we got back there, it was pretty much like we're going to Iraq. And, and that was, so, so we're still in, is this 05 or 06? 06. Okay, got it. Yeah, I joined, joined September 2005, and I was on a plane in September 2006 headed to Iraq. So that's uh, one of the things I wanted to do in the Marine Corps, as I mentioned, was just I wanted to deploy, and I was literally in the Marine Corps a year, and I was already on a plane headed overseas. And then did, at what point did you know you, where, where in Iraq you were going, that you were heading up to Haditha? I think we, we knew we were going to the Al Anbar in the northwestern part of Iraq, but we were never told what city. I think once we got to Al Assad and we were starting to relieve three three and hear about like what they went through and where they were at, is when we started really realizing, okay, this is where we're going. So it was when you actually got to, you got in country is when you realized, okay, we're going to Haditha. You knew that you were going to relieve three three. You probably heard a bunch of the stories, and I, I mean, so this is, so I was in I was in Ramadi at this time, um, you know, from the spring of 06 until the fall of 06. So you're, we overlapped probably by about a month, mm-hmm. maybe a little bit more, of when you arrived in Iraq and you flew into Al-Assad, you said? Flew in Al-Assad and we were there basically a day. And then while we were in Al-Assad, 3-3 was starting to um, pull some of their Marines out. And that's when we started interacting with them and they told us that they felt bad from what we were getting ready to get involved. They lost so many Marines while they were over there. and. And then it's just kind of like you hear stories of other guys in our company, like basically in a firefight just to get on their fob. And, you know, once we left Al-Assad, we, we took um, we flew up to the Haditha Dam in the middle of the night and 
stayed there overnight. We started loading our mags and we got in a big convoy and we we drove into Aditha. Hmm. And it was, um, I mean, you just like you hear the stories of Haditha from three three, and then when three one went through their um, stint before, and and it's just wild wild west and. Again, you only see it on TV. You never expect to be walking the same streets and, you know, this stuff going on. But, you know, the first time we went out on patrol, it was it was nerve-wracking. It was ner- like Because it's like you do this in training so much, and you, f- you feel like you do it so well. But now that you're in a situation where it's like, oh, gosh, you know, I got to look here. I got to look here. I got to look up. I got to look down. And what was your position in the platoon? I was a point man. Oh, get some. So, <laughs> it was a, and it, it was a... It was fun, you know. It was, uh, I think after the first firefight is when, like, you kind of like, okay, I can do this. This is good. I'm motivated now, you know. And and I was that guy. I remember one one time we got in a firefight, and um, before we went on patrol, I was like, gosh, I, I'm ready to get some. I'm ready to get a firefight, you know. And <laughs> and I didn't know my squad leader heard this, but after we got in like a two or three hour long firefight, <laughs> we're walking back onto the fob, and he yells at me, Bradford. And I'm like, what? And he's like, I'm gonna kill you. I'm like, what did I do now? You know, it's like I, we all come back alive. You know, I feel like that was a good thing, but. It was, uh, you know, it's it's funny. The first firefight we got into, we were in the palm groves, and we were walking along this compound wall, and these, these, you know, little trees. They're they're no bigger than they're no wider than a softball, and then there was one no wider than a baseball, and they open up from our left, and so me and my team leader jump behind the one that's the size of a a softball. And he's like, hey, Bradford, get over there by that tree. And I'm like, bull, bull crap, that one's smaller than this one, you know. And, and then our corpsman, who was a, uh, he was a, is a junior corpsman, he had the shotgun for breaching, and he laid off a round. And I don't, I'm pretty sure he didn't hit the guy, but the boom scared him, and he took <laughs> off. And, but it was just, uh, and of course, the same day in the Marine Corps, it's just uh, our comms went out, and so the, the, the stuff that we got was kind of crap. So it's like, here we are in the middle of the palm groves after a firefight, and we don't have no comms. We're shooting up um, smoke and trying to get somebody to come down there and help us, you know. And so, what was where were you guys living in Haditha? There was a fob in the middle of the town that we were um, that we stayed at. That was our home. It was right in the Iraqis houses. And was it a was it a platoon size element in there or a company size element in there? It, it was a company. The way that um, our battalion was split up, the battalion commander and the headquarters was much more in the dam, Haditha Dam, mm-hmm. and then. Haditha was the the main AO because it was the largest city, and that's where our company was, Echo Company, and we had um, we had Golf Company to the south of us in Hawklandia, and then across the river in Barwana was Fox Company, and and Weapons Company would basically go from 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 AO to AO, and about three months into the deployment, our battalion commander and the headquarters d- detachment would come, and they actually set up shop in Haditha with us once the Iraqi police, Iraqi army left our FOB. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, we had, uh, we, yeah, there was, it was a company element and we pretty much ran, you know, the fourth platoon would work more with the Iraqi police, the Iraqi army. And then the one platoon was basically set up for mobile and the other platoons would rotate back and forth between posts and patrol. So it was, I forgot how many days on we would be off on post duty and then you just kind of rotate back and forth and, when we were in Haditha, our mobile unit got hit so hard that they had to change out and uh, another platoon had to take over mm-hmm. just because of the, the snipers, the indirects, the IDs. Just, we lost so many guys. And throughout that whole deployment, the whole battalion lost 23 Marines. And I think Echo Company lost nine Marines. And um, a majority, I think, uh, I, I think all of them were within the first two or three months. Not to mention the Purple Heart recipients that we got from that deployment. And when you were, were you guys doing mostly, you guys were doing almost all foot patrol out of the FOB. I was, we were foot patrol, every patrol, and I actually felt safer walking the streets than I did in the vehicle. Yeah. And, um, I mean, we'd get in the back of a seven ton, and they're launching grenades over the seven ton trying to blow us up. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the one time that we were in a patrol with the Iraqi army, we were in the old old green Humvees with mm-hmm. no up armor. And me and my friend was sitting in the back seat. was like, good luck. I yeah. love you, brother. Because yeah. if this something happens right now, then we're we're screwed. Yeah, the, the old Humvees aren't going to take a ID hit very well. No, not at all. And it was like I, I loved being over there. You know, we were talking about serving this country and – you know, the one time that we're in Iraq, it's like 
we had one big screen TV in our chow hall, but we were never in a chow hall. We lived in an Iraqi house, and it was just our platoon. And you, you're away from the news. You're away from society. Everything going on, it was just you and your brothers. And that's the one thing, like, today I miss more than anything is just being around those guys. And you, you, you see them open up. And, you know, when, when, you're, when your Marine brother, you know, gets killed or wounded, like, you see the emotion that it's like you're there for him you know and he comes to you and those are the things that i miss more about the marine corps and you know unfortunately living in kentucky today it's like you're not around a marine corps base and you're you know i, I get to see my friends i don't know once a year it seems like and a lot of the guys in my platoon i haven't even seen since my injury the uh the what well, how long would you guys go out patrol for like uh, what would you guys patrol for a couple hours would you guys find an objective and then head that way and then check it out and then come back did you have an objective? Were you just doing presence patrols? What was that all about? We were doing a lot of meet and greets, present patrols, ID patrols. We'd go out for two or three hours. Um, sometimes we'd actually go out and set up a patrol base in the middle of town and just stay there for a couple of nights and run patrols out of the patrol base. Later on in the deployment, our, um, our company commander kind of made it a, an objective to set up patrol bases throughout the town. We had one in North Haditha, one in South, and then one out in kind of the... Um, I guess that'd be the, the the western part of Haditha, and um, which we'd basically we'd have engineers come in and they'd build like little little fobs out of these houses, and actually spent Christmas of 2006 on that the patrol base up in North Haditha, and it was sitting there on the roof in the middle of the night eating cold turkey and ham, you know. And <laughs> Merry but, Christmas, bro. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it, it's so funny because it's like they told us it's like oh you're going to have Christmas off. Like, yeah, nah, that didn't last very long because here we are on patrol going up to North Haditha, and, but it was a, uh, it was fun. I enjoyed it. And you know, one of the, some of the cool things that we did there, we were, we had a, they believed there was a, a cache in one of the islands, and there was no bridge, nothing to get to the island, and the only way to get there was to take river rafts. And I'm not gonna lie, that was the one time I felt like I was a Navy SEAL going down the Euphrates <laughs> River on a river raft, and. Uh, <laughs> But it was in the middle of the night, and they had a 240 on the front of it, and they would, you know, pick us up from the bridge, and we would ride up right to the the the, um, the island, and we actually dug in, dug in, and stayed there overnight, and 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 I, I believe that was Thanksgiving in 2006. So that was a, <laughs> happy holidays, yeah, the Once holidays, again. you know. So like looking back now on the holidays, on Thanksgiving and Christmas, it's like I just look back on those two moments of my life. It's like sleeping on a cold island because people look at Iraq and think it's warm all the time but it's pretty cold over there in the winter months and and then of course Christmas time sitting on the roof and how often were you guys getting indirect fire into your into your fob were they hitting you guys with mortars a lot we got mortared about every every day about five o'clock you know chow time (laughs) and one of the times like we had a I don't know it was like a hill it was like a big sand hill in the middle of our fob we had a couple of posts up on top of it and I was actually, we were on post duty and they was like, Bradford, won't you bring these batteries up to post five, which is at the end of it. And so I take a battery to it and I'm walking down and the, like going down, this is very steep. And while I'm halfway down, they start dropping mortars on us. And it's like, I'm thinking to myself, it's like, should I go back to the post or should I run? And like, I take off sprinting down the hill. Thankfully, I didn't like roll all the way down. And, and my team leader, like when I run in there, I was like, where's Bradford? And I'm like sitting there like gasping for air because I just like sprinted across the, this, you know, down this big hill. But, um, but yeah, we got, uh, we got mortared about every afternoon. And, and thankfully, they, their mortar sucked because, they missed, and um, <laughs> one of the times we were actually very lucky. We were in our fob, we were in our house, and we were all kicked back on our bunk beds. And my 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 really good friend, my best friend, actually was working on the hot air tank or whatever it was outside, and they dropped a mortar like thirty feet behind our house. And when that thing hit, we just automatically went to our gear because it sounded like it went right through the middle of our house. And he ended up taking shrapnel in the leg. And thankfully, that was it. And that's when I realized that, you know, I had to have many friends that got killed when I was over there, but I wasn't, you know, right there listening to them scream as they put a tourniquet on. And that's when I realized that this is real, you know. And not only, it's like this guy is like fighting to put a tourniquet on. And and he's my best friend. He was my roommate when I was in in our Hawaii. And 
it, it really killed me. Thankfully that he didn't lose a leg. He come back in a couple of weeks and he was sitting there showing us pieces of shrapnel and telling us that he went down to Alisaw and had some ice cream. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, you know, forget the way I felt about it, you know, but, but it's, uh, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the scary moments bring together the, the true brothers, you know, and the fellowship. And then how long was it, was it January, um, is when you got injured? January 18, 2007, and we were, you know, four months into a deployment. We started kind of, you know, you could start hearing a little scuttlebutt about the Advon coming in, you know, we're getting ready to start heading out, you know, the, the, the other units coming in, and I actually was speaking to my uncle on the phone that day, you know, and we rarely got to call home. And I was telling him, I was like, you know, the deployment's going well. You know, they're starting to talk about it, other guys coming in, you know, and and hung up the phone because we had to go to a brief. And the brief was the patrol. And, you know, unfortunately, I don't remember any of this part right here. I remember all the way up to, like, the last minute walking down the street. And as I was walking point, I look out in front of me, you know, we're walking along a road alongside the parallel or Euphrates River, it was called Park Place, and we were coming up past this compound wall into this opening with a bunch of palm trees. And I see a white bag leaned up against a palm tree about 30 yards off to my right. And as I, you know, it looked like that was a suspicious idol. Mm-hmm. And I turn around and tell my team leader to my left, he was on the other side of the road, and I turn around and tell everybody behind me. And the minute I turn back around and I look down, and there was this ditch that ran perpendicular to the road. And I see the wires going inside the pipe underneath the road, and, and I was standing right on top of the pipe. and. I mean, in a matter of seconds, it exploded and sent a shrapnel into both my eyes, and that, that was the last thing I ever saw was that white bag and those wires, and, um, you know, it's it it just laying there, conscious, like hearing everything going on around me, my squad leader calling in QRF, and, you know, just, and I actually had the, the litter kit in my pack, so it's like they had to figure that out, and then the whole time I was trying to stand up, you know, I had my left leg was it was blown off. Like I didn't have a left leg; my right leg was severely damaged. And um, but it just felt like people always ask me, like, what were you feeling when this was all going on? And it went so quick that I don't even think I had a chance to feel anything. Like I literally went from like walking down the patrol, seeing something suspicious, to laying on the ground looking in darkness. And I didn't know if that was it. If I didn't know if I was dead, and you know, it's just hearing voices around me. They put me in the kit and they take me into a compound. And you know, as we're waiting on QRF to get there, you know, my buddies look. They're sitting there holding my hand, talking to me because, you know, out of our squad, we probably got into the most firefights out of our whole company. But as we left the FOB with twelve Marines, we'd always come back with twelve Marines. We let the enemy know that. If you're going to mess with us, we're going to give you everything we got and more. And this is the first time that we suffered any kind of casualty. And laying there, like, you know, basically fighting for my life. And they're holding my hands, talking to me. But they, they didn't think I would make it out of there. And as QRF shows up, they put me in the back of a Humvee. And the last voice I heard was, as I mentioned earlier, the small Marine Corps was from my senior drill instructor who was a platoon sergeant in the same company, said, Bradford, you'll be fine. And then I passed out. I didn't know if that was it. I didn't know if I was truly dead now. That was the end. I felt like I was only 20 years old then. I felt like that was the end of my life. And those are the last words I heard. And, um, you know, I woke up three weeks later in a, from a coma, you know, and this is when I realized that what I truly love to do, that my true purpose in life was to serve this country wearing the uniform, and it was taken from me. Like, here I am in the United States while my brothers are over there in Iraq fighting right now. I felt like a coward. Like, they would try to, they would call me when they could, and I wouldn't want to talk to them on the phone. Like, I would always tell them with some kind of excuse that I'm sleeping or I'm doing something just so I didn't have to talk to them because I felt like I let them down. And that, it, it killed me. And then, once once my dad told me that I lost my legs, that was the worst thing in the world. Then I just wanted to die. I, 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 like The guilt, the depression, I, I didn't want to live a life anymore. And I always, I always told him, like when he told me that, I, was like, I felt like my legs were like a, a lizard's tail, you know? It's like they'll grow back. Like you see it on the news all the time, but you never expect it to happen to yourself. And here I am. I didn't care nothing about the vision. I just wanted my legs back. Because uh, it was, 
it was tough those first two or three weeks after getting out of ICU. Like, I wouldn't eat nothing. I was so skinny. I, I could barely lift my head up off the bed. And the hospital band that they gave me would go all the way up to my, my bicep pretty much because I just wouldn't want to eat. I wanted to die. Like, the nurses hated me. <laughs> like, one of one of the nurses come in at, like, 2 in the morning, and I finally got some sleep, and she kept poking me around with the needle, and uh, I, I literally called her a stupid idiot. I'm like... And and she wasn't my nurse no more, and and I, I felt so bad. But you know, it just I felt like my whole life was taken from me just from stepping in that bomb. You know, I knew what could happen to me, and my whole point of being deployed was I'm either going to come home with my brothers, or I'm going to come home in a body bag. There's no in the middle. And uh, and here I am now, down this whole dark path, this new road. You know, as a 20-year-old, how in the world am I going to live my life now? Like, I got, I don't even know what a blind guy with no legs can do. <laughs> and, At what point did you realize that you weren't going to be able to see anymore? It was pretty much March 2nd, I believe, was my last surgery that they tried to kind of, like, uh, give me some vision back. And nothing come back from that. And, you know, by the time March 2nd got there, I was still positive and upbeat. And I was moving around a lot more, starting to gain weight. And... um but, you know, it's they, they told me that they can do the surgery, but then they also told me that it's it's not a, you know, a high percentage that you're going to get vision back at all. You know, and they started kind of like talking about, um, you know, just living life visually impaired. And but it was uh, it was tough. It was it wasn't, you know, and to me, the, the vision didn't bother me much at all. It was losing my legs. And, you know, the Marine Corps. Uh, you know, it's the joining the Marine Corps in 2004 was the greatest decision of my life for the reasons like this right now, because it was the Marine Corps that was there each and every day in my hospital room talking to me and um, helping me understand that this road that I'm getting ready to go down, you know, that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And not only talking about my deployment or talking about the Marine Corps, but just talking about life and coming in there joking around with me and because uh, you know, looking back on it now, like I'm truly fortunate and blessed to be here today. Because the amount of blood I lost was a body's worth of blood. My left leg was taken from me. I have a piece of my small intestines taken out. You know, shrapnel went through both my eyes, and and you know, it's just it's truly a blessing. Now, that's obviously a a big transition of calling it a blessing and calling your where you're at right now a blessing from when you first you know realized your situation and you're saying hey you you wanted to die i mean that's i mean that's as, as bad as it gets what do you think it was that made you start to realize you know what all right here's my new situation and i'm going to i'm going to get after it the marines that would come in to visit me they kept reiterating that I was a Marine. The nurses, the corpsmen, even though I would fight it, they never gave up on me and they still pushed and challenged me. And I think that was the one thing that made me realize that this is just a new challenge for me. You know, the one thing in the Marine Corps is to adapt and overcome. I'm gonna have to learn to adapt to these in injuries and overcome it. And um, that's one thing that helped me realize that there's life outside those hospital doors because at that time when I was going through the depression and guilt, there was two roads I could have went down, you know, the self-pity, the drugs, alcoholism, suicide. But I didn't want to go down that road. I didn't want to be another statistic. I wanted to go down the road of happiness and living my life to the fullest and proving people wrong. People tell me I can't do something, that I'm going to go out and do it. I want to be that blind guy with no, no legs proving people wrong, you know. And, and that's what I always told people when I first got hurt. I was like, anything you can do, I can do. I might do it differently, but it's going to get done. And during that time with that Marine coming in that hospital room, this is when I realized in my mind that this is what I want to do. I want to, I want to put myself in his position. I want to help out other severely wounded warriors, Marines, soldiers, sailors, airmen. And I, I began creating these goals and these, and I, you know, so a lot of them broad. The one broad one was staying in the Marine Corps. And, you know, but I realized that I need to do these little goals first. I need to learn to get out of my hospital bed. I need to go from hospital bed to my wheelchair and I need to learn to eat. And the once I started realizing this and I started putting my mind in the right direction, 
then I started getting off medications. I started getting off pain pills, and I started getting more weight on my body. And I was injured on January 18th. I was in Bethesda on January 21st, and by March 21st, I was headed to my the Poly Trauma Center in Richmond, Virginia, where I would focus more on physical therapy and occupational mm-hmm. therapy. So it's like, you know, I, I was young and I healed quicker, but once I got it in my mind that I could do this, then I, I didn't need, I didn't want anybody slowing me down. And, <laughs> and I, you know, I went through the Poly Trauma Center and I was there for two months. And by June 29th of 2007, I was standing up on my prostate legs for the first time. Mm-hmm. And uh, you, you know, one, one of the things that I talk about when I talk to vets is I always tell them, you know, people say, well, how do we get through this? And I always say, you got to find a new mission. And because, you know, you've had this mission, whatever that mission was, whether whatever service branch you were in, wherever you were fighting, you had a mission. And it makes your life very clear and simple because what you do every day is you try and accomplish the mission. And when I when I hear you talking about that, it's like, it's exactly that. You were in a situation, you had a mission, boom. You get blown up, now you don't have a mission anymore. Mm-hmm. And now when you get you wake up in Bethesda, you're you're in this situation, you go, Oh, I don't I don't I'm depressed. I I don't want to live anymore. Mm-hmm. And then someone comes in and says, hey, y- you could help. And then all of a sudden, boom, you have a new mission. And as soon as you get that new mission, you go, yes, I can. Oh, and by the way, you, you don't think I'm going to be able to walk? You don't think I'm going to be able to defend for myself? Watch this. <laughs> <laughs> That's on, and, you know, like, looking back now, January 18, 2007, I felt like that was the day that the, the Lord above looked down on me. He didn't want me to, he didn't want me to go to heaven yet. And he gave me, he put me on a new patrol in life, as you mentioned, mission. Mm -hmm. And that was to share my story and inspire others by living my life to the fullest and beyond my own bare minimal. And I I feel like that, um, I feel like that was my new mission in life. That, you know, we're all brought on this earth to serve in some kind of purpose, serve some mission. And, you know, sharing my story and going out doing things that I'm doing today is inspiring and motivating others, not those who were injured in combat, but people who are living, you know, a civilian life today. And it, it truly in- inspires and motivates me to continue doing what I'm doing because I know that I'm inspiring somebody along the way. And I always tell people, if I could do inspire and motivate one person a day, then that's a job well done for me. And that's what I'm left on this earth to do. And um, I love it, you know, it's just, uh, this is what I've been given. And I might as well accept it and move on, you know, improvise. Something that we're always learning in the Marine Corps. And, you know, when I, when I do speaking engagements, I, I focus on a lot of things in the Marine Corps that I learned, like adapt and overcome. And, you know, the next one is lead by example, which you know a lot about, I'm sure. And then the next one's never quit. And through it all, through those three, attitude is everything. If you walk into any situation with a positive attitude, that's the first step to success. If you think about something negatively, then you're never going to accomplish anything. So when I was laying in that hospital bed, there was no negative thoughts, you know, and I, I had guys, one of the Marines who were actually was wounded two months before me, lost a leg in Haditha, would come in day and night, and he would also kind of tell me, it's like, all right, this is what's going to go on. You know, you're going to get a prosthetic. It's going to be a long, you know, it's, the rehab's intense, but this is it, you know, but put one foot in front of the next. And that's what I kept living life with. And when I was trying to learn how to walk in 2007, I was, uh, as a double amputee, you tend to scissor walk one foot in front of the next and you pretty much trip over yourself and you look like an idiot. But, um, but with vision, I was going from the right wall to the left wall. And my physical therapist stopped me and was like, Matt, just stop, just, just walk. Put one foot in front of the next. And I look back on that now, and that's how we live each and every day. It's like we never know what tomorrow is going to hold or next week. We just got to worry about right now in the present. And that's how I live my life right now. And I never know what that next step's going to be, but I'm going to take that step forward. You know, and, you know, I might walk around with two prosthetic legs and look darkness in the, you know, the face every day. But I'll tell you one thing, my, uh, my toes are pointed forward and my vision on life is 2020. And that's what I tell people today. And it's, uh, I love it. I love it. And it's, you know, it's the adrenaline, the motivation to do things when you can't see. 
and it hurts when you run into things too. So, <laughs> so the attitude of just walk. That's that's a that's a beautiful attitude to have. Just walk. Quit quit all this other stuff. Just get up, walk. How hard was the transition from the bed to the wheelchair to the to the prosthetics to walk and to moving on the prosthetics? It really I think the getting used to the prosthetics was you know, basically getting my legs used to wearing prosthetics. And that that was the hardest thing because like I would go to therapy every day and I would put them on and I'd walk around in therapy, but then I'd go right back to the wheelchair. And I really never, never wore them more than you know, a couple hours a day just because I just wore them in therapy until I went to the, the blind school in Chicago. And this gave me the opportunity where I had no chance to go back to my room and take them off. So I had to wear them from seven in the morning to five at night. And that's helped me strengthen up my legs and the calluses on my legs get used to wearing prosthetics. And once I got back from the, the blind school, six months there, I was pretty much on my legs from sunrise to sunset. Mm. And, and uh, that was, uh, but you know, through you know, setting these goals early on in my rehab, like you know, re-enlisting in the Marine Corps was the one thing that I wanted to do. And so learning how to walk, I focused on that more than my my blindness because I, I knew learning uh, learning life you know in the dark would be a lot easier with legs mm -hmm. and that helped out so much because I, I tried to maneuver around in a wheelchair being blind and a long cane and all this stuff and I just kept running into more things but once I got on my legs and I started using a long cane and started walking around and you know I, it, it really helped out a lot so yeah. like the, that's like the ultimate form of prioritize and execute like yeah you know what okay i can't see but i can't walk the number one thing i'm gonna do is learn how exactly to walk. that's and that, what you did and that, that's what they like you know it's you said get from the hospital bed to the wheelchair to the prosthetics and then go to the blind school knock that out and once i'm at the blind school i'm learning everything from computer to independent living and that's a six-month school going to the blind school the 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 first program is six months and that's basically learning to live being visually impaired and you go back for computers and um, they got so many different programs now, but I went there for basically from July to December, just because I, I incorporated computers in with my program as well. And, uh, so I spent from July to December in, in Chicago. So I experienced the cold weather there, but you know, I learned everything from, you know, checking emails to Braille to taking, um, taking a subway and train all the way downtown Chicago and circling a block and even build a birdhouse when I was in Chicago. And I don't know about you, but a table saw scared me when I had vision, <laughs> <laughs> trying to, trying to cut, cut a piece of board with no vision. That, that's a little intimidating there, but uh, I didn't lose a finger, thankfully. So, yeah, you know, that, that's another thing that I'm, I'm hearing about what you're saying is like the way and, and this is something you hear all the time, but the way that you're describing it is people say, oh, you know, you're gonna get your big goal. You know, you got your big goal in the future, but what you have to do is you have to set up these little goals along the way to get you there that are pointing in the right direction. So your big goal is you wanted to stay in the Marine Corps, be able to reenlist. In order to be able to do that, you had to be able to walk, and you had to be able to function. And so you just had to fight through these little things every single day to make progress. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because you know, the, the way I've honestly described this before is like, it's like shooting. When you're looking, you know, you got your target that's far off in the distance, 400 meters away. If you stare at that thing, your vision's gonna get blurry and mm -hmm. you'll lose track of it. So you have to f focus on the front sight. You f this front sight focus, that's what you do. Yep. And that, the, the thing in the background, you know, it kind of fades a little bit, but you know it's there. And then what happens is occasionally, and so it's the same thing with your goals, right? You have your long-term goal, but that thing's so far away sometimes it gets blurry. And yeah. if you, and so what you do is you focus on some little thing that's right in front of you that you can do, and then that brings you a little bit closer to the goal. But occasionally, those little things that are short term, you're doing them day after day after day after day, they, they start to grind on you, and you say, you know what, forget it. I don't even wanna do this today. Mm -hmm. And that's when you have to look up once again at your long-term goal and say, wait a second, I'm moving in that direction, I'm trying to get there. But to hear you describe these little things, and by the way, you're throwing them out there like it's no big deal. <laughs> like, oh, I just was, I went from the bed to the wheelchair to the, to the, to the prosthetics, then I went to the blind school, and the next thing you know, I'm making bird cages <laughs> or bird feeders. 
And like I'm, I mean, the 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 small effort or the small task that took immense effort along the way, but you know, from my perspective, what I see is you made each and every one of those things a mission. Like mm-hmm. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Okay, I can do that now. Cool. I'm going to do this. And these are small little progressive steps, but you're making them, and you're making them every day. Every day you get up and you just walk, yeah. walk forward. And that, that's the one thing with being in the Marine Corps and has really helped me out along this way is, you know, being organized and getting in that routine where, you know, you wake up each and every day. It's like, okay, I'm going to knock this out. This is my goal for the day. And, you know, bettering myself was one of the goals because I knew that if I couldn't get nothing done in this life if I didn't better myself first. And, you know, through the early days of my recovery, getting off pain pills was one of the first things that I wanted to do as well. And, it's been 12 years since I last take a pain pill. And that's, you know, and it's, uh, I didn't, I didn't want my life to, you know, revert back to pain pills and just, you know, I feel a little bit of pain, then, then I'm going to like go get, take a pill. And, you know, I replace that with staying busy, staying active, going to the gym, working out. And, and it, it really helped out a lot. I didn't just, um, you know, if I felt like if I got pain, then I'm going to go give it some pain, you know, and that's, and that's, uh, and it's the one thing, and it's just, uh, you know, through, through it all, I've, I've learned along the way is like, people told me I couldn't do something or I can't do it. Why do you want to stay in the Marine Corps? You make so much more money outside of the Marine Corps. I'm like, well, I didn't join the Marine Corps for money, you know, and that's, that, that I use that as motivation and it guided me along this way. And, and, um, you know, I just, I pretty much just like whatever you know you think that for yourself but I know what I my mission in life is and I kept a positive attitude and people saw that and you know and once I got back from the blind school in 2009 I started getting out doing these events and the first event I actually did was something I opened my mouth up to my physical therapist and forgot all about until like two months before it was the baton death march in 2009 and he walked up to me and he was like oh Matt you're gonna do the baton death march this year right you said last year and I'm like oh crap and you know, I walked out and I did 10 miles in eight hours. And that was the first, like I was proud of doing 10 miles in eight hours, but that was the first vent, first hike that I ever fell out of that I quit on. So for people that don't know, the Baton Death March is an event that they do out here and it's it's 26 miles, right? It is. And, and you it, gotta bring a, you gotta wear a ruck. Some people, yeah, I, I just wore Camelback. <laughs> <laughs> but they do a, so, well, explain explain what what the Baton Death March is. Obviously, it's to commemorate or to to remember the the folks that were actually on the real Baton Death March. But what is one that they do here? This this year actually was their thirtieth annual Baton uh, Memorial Death March in White Sands, New Mexico. When I did it in two thousand nine, they uh, it's a twenty six point two long or mile long marathon, and then they also have a fourteen mile honorary, and um. The, the 26.2 miles actually up a mountain and down a mountain and it's it's intense because you're walking through the sands and a part of it is this loose sand pit and it's a you know it's it's a good test especially for people with prosthetics and you know and your kind of endurance and see how far you can go and when I signed up in 2009 I walked 10 miles out in eight hours and I was like all right that's pretty proud you know I just got hurt two years ago but then I, I, I like again like I quit and then that really bugged me and I use that as motivation and it humbled me knowing that all right you know I was a good runner before I never quit on any hikes like I would always finish and then I it realized that okay I'm not who I am before so I gotta learn learn this way now you know and it, not everything's as easy as it used to be but once once I finished like I told the lady I told my therapist and I was like once I'm done I'm putting my medical board and I'm going for my reenlistment package. And and I was like, all right, 10 miles in. And and that was in March of 2009. And basically August of 2009, I got my, you know, my ratings back, of course, 100%. And I chose to go through the EPLD program, Extended but Permanent Limited Duty. And um, that took all the way till April of 2000, or the end of March of 2010. And actually today, April 1st, would been was the day that I, I was promoted to corporal. And with the battalion commander that called me when I was in San Antonio was like, hey, congratulations, you're getting promoted to corporal. And I was like, sir, is this an April Fool's joke? You know, it's like, and it's, uh, and but, 
But uh, on April 7, 2010, I re-enlisted. I raised my right hand and got a chance to stay in the Marine Corps for a few more years. And that, yeah. that was the greatest thing ever right there. Yeah, no, that's that's the reason why I started off today reading that oath, because for you to be doing that in the condition you were in, having already sacrificed and saying, you know what, I got more to give, and mm. I'm going to give it. And that's the one thing, like when I was mentioned lead by example, one of my therapists told me, you know, as I go to therapy every day and I put my legs on, I stand up, I walk out, you know, just I do my own thing. And he's like, Matt, you don't ever, you won't see this, of course, and you will never realize this. But every day when you walk in here, you sit down and you put your prosthetics on and get up and walk out. People stare at you and people look at you. And and that's the right thing to lead by example. You know, it's like if you wake up each and every day and you do it the right way, then people will follow, you know, and and I've learned now, it's like from living my life, it's just to wake up and continue doing the right thing, then people will follow. And, you know, it's 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 something that I focus a lot on. It's not being an intense yelling leader, but it's just doing it the right way. And that's something that I've done along the way. And, of course, in therapy, if you're in the Marine and you're an Army guy on the ground, then you don't want that Marine up there walking. It's like, I need to beat this guy. And, <laughs> so, right. and then you also ended up going to college, right? I did. I, I did. Um, and what year did you start college? I started in 2011 at uh, Coastal Carolina Community College in Jacksonville, North Carolina. It was once I re-enlisted, they asked me where I wanted to go. I don't want to go to Wounded Warrior Battalion, East Camp Lejeune, because I realized my I could help out more there. And I got there, and in 2011, I went on a closure trip back to Iraq, and that's when I realized that I joined the Marine Corps to deploy. And I can't deploy now, but I could still share my story and I don't have to share my story wearing the uniform. Is it the Marine Corps that takes you on the closure trip? It was a nonprofit Troops oh. First Foundation, and um, it's uh, and actually the 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 episode that I went on, sixty minutes aired it in two thousand eleven. Oh, okay, so it's on YouTube. But uh, a good, nice plug. Well, we'll watch it then. <laughs> but it's uh, but I learned a lot about my time in the Marine Corps, and and the one thing with being a Marine is you're always a Marine, and that's a title I get to take to my grave and. When I'm 85 years old, I can look at my great grandkids and be like, I served in the United States Marine Corps. And um, so it's, and during that time, we were starting a family and I was getting ready to take college classes. So the one thing that I'm very fortunate about is everything through life, like it, each step, each chapter, it comes right after the next one. Like I never have a time to sit down and think about what's next. And, you know, I got out in 2012, and we moved right back to Kentucky, and I started taking college classes. And, you know, my, my brilliant and amazing wife, you know, while we're trying to figure out where we're going to live, she's like, You've, your dream school is University of Kentucky. So let's move back to there, and you can go to school there and graduate there. And I started taking classes there in 2014. And May of 2017, I walked across the stage at Rupp Arena and got my diploma in media arts and history. And... <laughs> And it's a, uh, you know, not only a marine for life, but a wildcat for life. And <laughs> I felt, I felt, I feel, I feel a little strange being the, you know, the thirty-year-old like kid, you know, partying like a ten-year-old there when the basketball team won or something like that. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm just that old creepy dude over there now, and not, <laughs> not the youngster anymore. But, but it, it was, um, it was fun to go back and take college classes and everything that I learned that I should have learned in high school. Like I'm like loving college now. When I spoke at a um, a child development center a couple of months ago, and the kids asked me, "I was like, what What do you think of school?" I'm like, you know, it's I wasn't the greatest of students in high school, but I tell you what, I loved college. I loved going back and reading books. I love to read now, and and it it just expands my mind and my knowledge on things. And it's a uh, you know, it's good going down and sitting down with people and. And you could share stories on different things and not just something about the military, but you could talk about this and this. And, you know, it's uh, it was fun. And so do you you're I, I want to just kind of jump back to your workouts a little bit. And I know you post some of your workouts in uh, on, on Twitter and stuff. Some little shots sometimes. I know you posted one the other day of you put pushing a sled. You said you're pushing the pushing sled all the way out to California. Legit. <laughs> uh do you wake you wake up every day? Is that the first thing you do? Is is try and get your workout in? I try to. I I prefer working out in the morning, but now with traveling and you know catching up hours at work, I had to do evening workouts, which I I, I hate doing evening workouts. I'm ready to get home, take my legs off. Mm. But but those are the those are the I work out in the evening. I tried to 
get them in as much as I possibly can. I love to work out. And if not, then I'll just do it at home. I got some dumbbells and curls. I'll do curls there. And, um, but you know, throughout, throughout the day, I'm like constantly on my legs, walking around, you know, doing some cardio, mm-hmm. but you know, I love, I love taking shots at you there, Jocko on Twitter, <laughs> you know, and that's a, um, I think one of the tweets I actually mentioned to you, I was like, you do the squat and I'll do the push in the sled. And <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's like, even through, even through training, my trainer, it's funny because I joke with him all the time. I'm like, his name's Josh. And I'm like, look, you're just here to walk me from machine to machine. All right. I, I'll tell you what I want to work out today. And, and, um, like it, it'll get to the point where I'll, right, I'm getting bored doing pull-ups, put some chains on me and mm. I'll do some pull-ups with some chains on me and something like that. I'll do some push-ups, or I'll get to the bench press and do some chains on the bench press. And it's like just something else to challenge it instead of sticking to the same old thing, you know, everyday thing. And it's, uh, and you know, I, I'm personal best on the bench press a couple of weeks ago at 260 i'm proud of that and then of course pushing the sled and um but now it's like uh, you know I, i've learned doing the i do spartan races and marathons and i've yeah. done a marathon and i did a marathon and i forgot what year it was but i didn't work out or get back on the bike for a whole year and after doing the next marathon i was so sore for like a week <laughs> and i realized like if i stay active in the gym and work out then i'm not as sore and um, so like I, I, New, I, news flash, yeah, <laughs> stay in the gym. <laughs> and it's a, so it's like, I, I work out as much as I possibly can because it's like, I never know what, what, you know, this, the organization I do a lot of these events with, like sometimes they'll just call me up like, Hey, you want to do a Spartan race in two weeks? It's like, uh, sure. You know? And, <laughs> and you know, through, <laughs> as, as uh. yeah. <laughs> let me start, let me start drinking some water now. And, but, and you know, it's like through this, it's like, each year I try to find something new to do. And for some weird reason this year, I was like, I've I've got on a stationary bike because uh, my goal is to, in July, I'm going to bike from Seattle to Portland. It's like a 203 mile two day event. And then my ultimate goal in August is to bike across Kentucky on a tandem bike. And, um, so I got on a stationary bike in January for the first time I got on any kind of bike in 20 years. And, I'm like, holy smokes, this is weird. <laughs> and it's like my left leg, like the above the knee side, like it didn't work so well on pedaling. So I just took it off and started pedaling on my right leg. Oh, and okay. the most I've done was 7.5 miles in 26 minutes. And I went to my trainer and I looked at my wife and I'm like, this is the one thing that I feel like I'm doing normal. You know, I feel like I can keep up with uh-huh. somebody with legs. And um, so I really enjoyed that. And I'm looking forward to it. But, um, you know, like last year I climbed Mount Rainier or half a, half of Mount Rainier. And um, this year I'm going to go out and summit it hopefully in July. So that is uh, anything I can do to really like challenge myself. And I always, uh, I always tell my prosthetist, I'm like any, like I got the X3 on my left leg, which is like the best of the best. And I'm like, my goal in life is to break this leg. <laughs> it's like, if I could break it, then that's the, that's a check in the box. And, you know, and, and uh, the uh, baton death march. You went back at that thing, right? I attacked that two weeks ago, and uh, <laughs> I don't know if you know what it feels like to run into a train, but that's what I felt like Monday afternoon. But it was uh, the 2009 really, like I mentioned, it humbled me, and it motivated me You know, for the next 10 years. It's like everything I'm going to do, I'm going to focus on this right here. Like I went into the baton in 2009, and then my prosthetics wasn't as good or advanced as they are now. So when I went out there two weeks ago, I... Um, I knocked it out 14 miles. I knocked out eight miles, and we we stepped off at 6:56, and by 11:20 I hit the eight mile marker. They gave me a 45 minute mile pace, and I was knocking out a mile in 25 minutes. And it was, I don't know if it was uh, my knee was hurting or just the whole fact that I'm getting ready to cross the finish line. But it was like I was getting a little emotional. I'm like, man, this is really happening, you know, and to go out and walk this far on two prosthetics. And I tell you one thing, the miles are a lot longer when you can't see, that's for sure. And, mm. but, um, it was, it was fun, you know, and I, I, I was, uh, I was out of my legs for about a week. Actually this last Tuesday is the first time I put my legs on for the first time. So it's, a. Uh, but and, you know, and then, is that because you just trashed the skin? My left leg had a couple of little rub spots on it, and <laughs> so my wife she uh, took a picture and sent to my prosthetist, and then she became my nurse. <laughs> and but not to mention this uh, Saturday, I just walked three point six five miles in a 
like a they call it it's a run to bluegrass in Lexington and my wife she sent me a text and she was like hey I think about walking this you can get in your wheelchair and I'll push you I'm like look I'm not going to get a medal sitting in a wheelchair right I'm either going to walk it or I'm not going to do it okay and so we signed up for the 3.65 miles and we will finish that in an hour and 23 minutes and for some weird reason I think walking might be my thing this year too but I have to get you out and do a race with us. Come and get it. Hey, I've been I've been looking into the um, what's the what's the Navy SEAL obstacle course? Uh, oh, the uh, well, you mean the one that's in Coronado, the it, actual obstacle course? Oh no, no, not that one. I'm not that oh. advanced yet. No, I'm I'm a Marine. <laughs> is it is it the Bone Frog or Bone Frog? Oh, or? the Bone Frog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've been looking into that. So um, right on. Well, I'm sure those guys will hook you up if you want to go and get after it. Yeah, I, I don't, I'm not big on the water and stuff there, but you know. <laughs> We'll do everything else. That might not be a great uh, combination if you don't yeah. like the water too much, because I'm sure they put some water into that. Thing. Yeah, that's a. Yeah, that's a no. <laughs> hey, what was that? What was that closure trip? You know, speaking about emotional, that had to be emotional going going to Iraq again. It, it was the whole t- um, when it was mentioned to me in 2011. The only image in my mind that kept popping up is like either a Black Hawk going down or a C-130 or something happening because it's like I walked away. Actually, I, I was medevaced out of that country, you know, from from my injuries. So it's like I had no good good image of that country at all. And it was nerve-wracking. It was even more nerve-wracking being around, like, the Iraqi security forces. You know, they're clearing rooms and doing mount training, and here we stand with no weapons or anything. Like when I was in Iraq, no Iraqis had rifles or AKs. Mm-hmm. And so that that really kind of, um, it, it made me worried a lot. But I think one of the coolest moments that, that really helped me understand it was we were meeting the Iraqi security forces and they were all walking up, shaking our hands in, in you know, good uniforms. And um, they had a patch. And one of the guys took his patch off and put it on my flag jacket. Mm-hmm. And gave me a big hug, and I'm like, you know what? This is this is it. One team, one fight here, you know. And there's there's bad people all over this world, but there's a lot more good people in this world too. And and I think and it really, um, it it, it made the trip as we were flying back home. We were going over Iceland, and the pilot brought back this little letter, and he gave it to my buddy, and my buddy read it to me, and it said, "U.S. forces have killed Osama bin Laden." Hmm. And I was like, you know what? That's the perfect closure to a closure trip because like we all joined the military after 2001 to go after him you know to kill him and and knowing that this happened on my closure trip it's like it it, it honestly like gave me it got me emotional i was just ready to go home be with my family and that 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 capped it off pretty well and i will say when i was in iraq in 2006 saddam hussein was killed so Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden, you know, so it's like, why not? <laughs> but, you know, like I got so much out of that closure trip. I learned a lot about my life and like what the next step in my life is. And, but like I mentioned earlier, like when I went back to Afghanistan in 2017, never been to Afghanistan before in my life, but I felt like I got more out of that closure trip because going to Iraq in 2011, I was still in the Marine Corps wearing the uniform every day. In Afghanistan, I haven't put the uniform on in five years. And to put the uniform back on and go around and speak to soldiers about my Marine Corps career and be around the military again truly made me miss it more than anything in the world. And, you know, the brothers that I met in the Marine Corps and in the military alone, like, they're forever going to be there. You know, no matter where you live at in this country, they're always going to be there for you. And knowing that the you you know the the name tag across your chest united states of america that that means more to me than anything in this world and if if i was called back to serve this country again and again knowing the risk and what could happen to me then i'd go back and do it all over again because these last 12 years have been truly amazing and i've done things that i would never thought i could do and i've done it differently and like through the adrenaline through the adversity and it's just it's inspired and motivated me to come along the way and you know and it's 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 a it's a life i love to live and even in the dark but i know one day will come and there will be light in my eyes you know and i'll be able to open my eyes and see every day but for right now i'm going to live my life to the fullest yeah that's uh incredible do you 
do you ever, you know, I, I'll hear from people all the time, oh, I don't feel like doing this today. I don't feel like doing that. I don't want to work out today. I don't want to, I don't want to get up and do my job today. You know, does that, when you hear that kind of thing, what are your thoughts on that? I know for me personally, when I wake up and I don't feel like doing something, then I try to, or if I feel like I'm in a down mood, then I try to keep that in, in the house. Like, I don't want to go out in the public because I don't want people to see that. Like when I go out in public, I want them to see happy Matt, you know, positive. But hearing people like just it, it, it it's hard to hear people complain about things these days, you know, and because you know I know what Iraq looked like, and I you know I was in Afghanistan, and you know I know what happened to me, and I know where I was 12 years ago, and what I had to do to overcome that, you know, and it's just some people just when they feel like they can't do it, they just get down in the dumps and they give up. And really, it's like you got to learn to battle through those adversities. And, you know, at the end of the day, when you put your head down on the pillow and close your eyes, you wake up to a new day, you know, and a new day with new challenges. But you got to learn to overcome those challenges because in life, it's a mountain. You're going to continue to climb up a mountain and it's never going to flatten out. You're constantly going to go over any, you know, obstacles, boulders, whatever is in your way. And the only way to go over it is to climb it. It's not to find an easy way around or turn around and quit. You know, and you got to learn to just overcome things and, and honestly never give up, never quit. Yep. I mean, I think I, clearly you represent that to the fullest. So what are you doing right now in terms, I know you got a job. What's that, what's that all about? So um, it's funny how I got this job because my last year at UK, I was, I had to go for an internship and the internship, the internship that I was going for was at the uh, where I go hunting at, and I was like, okay, well, I'll do that. But then like people kept tagging me on Facebook about this Wounded Warrior Fellowship position that was opening up, and I was like, Matt, you should try this out. And I contacted one of my friends, and and he was like, yeah, just show up at our office on this date, and um, you can intern with us, and then we'll talk about the position. And I show up on the first day at our office, and everybody's like, who are you? I'm like, and then he ended up getting kind of in trouble for this, but. But it was a, uh, so I, you know, I interned there and then um, went to the interview in June and basically was hired on the spot. And I've been working with the congressional office for two years doing veterans outreach. Um, you know, we, I do some case work with veterans, but truly it's just getting out in the district and being around veterans and kind of letting them know what kind of legislative um, the bills are out there that could affect them both positive and negatively. I mean, there's a, so much out there that they need to know about. And it's been truly a joy, you know, getting to work with a lot of Vietnam veterans. And, um, you know, these are some of the happiest guys that I've ever met in my life for what they had to go through, you know. And and just hearing them walk up to me and be like, because I've had them come just to our office in tears just to, like, to shake my hand or get a hug from me and stuff like that, going through, you know, heart problems or whatever. And they're like, you know what, just being here and seeing you and what you've gone through that it motivates me to continue doing what I'm doing because you're inspiring me. And it, it brings tears to my eyes because it's like, you know, it's as a veteran, you know, veterans serving veterans, we need to look out for our own. It doesn't matter if it's a job or not, but, you know, the suicide rate right now is sad. And, you know, we got to learn to reach out and be with each other because we're the only ones that trust and the only ones that will open up to each other. And that's the one thing that I've really... You know, I've tried at first, which is very hard to keep my personal life from my work side. But, you know, these it's when you sit down and you talk to a veteran and you share what you went through and and they share what they went through and you kind of come together and you talk about things and you you know, at the end of the day that you're helping them out just as much as they're helping you out. It truly means the world. And it's it knows that, you know, veterans serving veterans, we need to stick together. Yeah, there's there's no doubt. And you're doing all that and you're also raising three kids. Three kids, three amazing kids actually. And uh, <laughs> you know, my wife and I we're uh, April 7th to be our 7th uh, wedding anniversary. So we're uh, But you know, it's through it all the one thing that if I could teach anybody in life, it's teaching those kids that you know, challenges are going to come. But you got to find a way. Life isn't easy. Life's hard. And and if they could look at me and look at what I've gone through and what I continue to do today and use that as motivation to, you know, better themselves and better their lives and understand that, 
yes, I might have failed this test, but you know what? I'm going to go home and I'm going to get in the book and I'm going to I'm going to get an A on this next one. Then that's all that matters. And you know, to talk about him a little bit, is Nolan, who's 15, he'll turn 16 in a couple of weeks. A couple of years ago, he had a birthday party, and and um, there was this girl in his class or in his school that had no arms and no legs, and he didn't know her, but he went up to her and gave her a birthday. Um, uh, he invited her to his birthday, and it like he come home and told me and Amanda that, and that truly brought tears to our eyes because it's like. They're, they get it. You know, when I was their age, if I saw a kid that was in, you know, a special ed class, I didn't walk up and try to talk to them. I, you know, I felt like they were different than me, and I stayed away from that. But, you know, knowing that he walked up to a girl with no arms and no legs and was, you know, invited her to his birthday party truly brought tears to our eyes because it's like, again, he gets it. He's growing up. He's a man right now, you know, and Emma, she is just as mature as she is so helpful and caring and compassionate. And Layla is the same thing. You know, she's seven years old right now, but it's the, the cutest thing in the world is to hear her get around her friends and tell her stories about how I got hurt. You know, somehow the bad guys blew my legs off and killed me. And <laughs> she told her teacher that. And I can only imagine what her teacher thought when I walked in the classroom, you know. But, but it's just... You know, they're always there. If I need them, they're there to help out. And, you know, to to my wife, I mean, she's truly amazing. She has a job herself, but she stops everything she can to get me to work, me to an event, me to a speaking engagement, to wherever, to get the three kids to wherever they need to go. Our two girls are in horseback riding lessons right now. And still she finds time to work out twice a day, actually. She, uh, you know, nine to nine to two job. And, and it's, you know, she does dinner, laundry, everything. And then she still crawls in bed by eight o'clock at night. I mean, you know, if there's motivation in my life and there's a true hero for me to look up to, it's her because she's truly amazing. And I couldn't ask for a better wife and a better, you know, friend, best friend, role model, mentor. And, you know, if there's any award out there to give to her, then, I mean, it, I would, I would be up for it and I'd be the first one to sign on to it. Well, that's awesome. It sounds like you uh sounds like you found the the perfect per, the perfect girl for you. She is and you know throughout all of this it's you know the the hardest thing is to to set back and like appreciate it and the one thing that I truly don't like I I always cross if I cross the finish line I always look to see what's next. I don't set back and enjoy it. And she's there to kind of like to almost honestly humble me a little bit and to set back and like let me remember what i went through to get to where i am today and without her i don't know if i could live this life right now you know it's always talk about it it's um you know it's a tough road you know i'm I'm, i am blind i have bad days and some days i don't want to wake up and go on but i tell you every day you know or every night i pray that maybe one day i'll wake up and i'll be able to see my wife and my kids and when I wake up, I still look at darkness. And then I go through my morning routine, and I still grab my prosthetic legs and I put them on. So I'm constantly reminded of January 18, 2007. And I use that motivation to go on and love my family and love my kids and go out and do these extraordinary things because I'm never going to let that guy who pushed that button and blew me up defeat me. Even though I don't know where he's at right now, he's never going to get the sense of relief that he defeated me that day. And you know, while I'm going through these bad moments... I mean, nothing soothes the soul and makes the heart feel so much better than hearing your seven-year-old daughter walk into you and say, hey, Daddy, I love you. All right, man. Um, I don't even know if I have anything else to say after that, man. That's just, uh, that's awesome. Um, I, yeah, man, I think we're good. I think we're good. I think I think that's a good place to stop. Uh, man, it's just awesome to uh, sit here and talk to you and you know hear your story. Um, I know Echo's got a couple things to cover. What do you got, Echo? Sure, a few things. It. <clears throat> I always think about this too. Like you know how um, Matt, you're saying, like you can choose to kind of go down two paths, right? So 
and it this picture starts to get uh, kind of painted in my head when I hear like these cool stories. So like I don't know, you know, like if you're, uh, it's gonna be a bad analogy, but bear with. Me. We all know you're good. <laughs> yeah, we all know you're good at bad analogies. Bear with me here. So let's say you're trying to, I don't know, like let's say you have an ant problem, right? You mean like little bugs, ants? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, not like, like have, an, not like an, not problems. like my aunt. Whatever. No, 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 not again. Okay. So let's say you have an ant problem, right? So uh-huh. it's it's it, it's you against the ants, right? So let's say uh-huh. you say, okay, I'm gonna set out these traps for the let's not ants. <laughs> let's say mice. Let's say mice. I was gonna mice, say because right? if you got ant traps, you right, know. Right. Maybe that's so there's a mouse trap. <laughs> let's say you put a mouse trap out for your uh, mouse problem, uh-huh. right? And then uh, you know someone uh, or a mouse comes and gets caught in the trap. Yeah. You don't kill it though. You were trying to kill the, all the mice, right? Okay. But it, you don't kill the mouse. The mouse, like somehow, you mess it up though. Uh-huh. But the mouse gets away. So not only did you not kill the, and then the mouse now goes, recovers, and now teaches all other mice how to get past mouse traps. Okay. Your mouse trap kind of worked against you. So like just like when Matt said, oh yeah, that guy who pressed the button to to, you know, to blow up the bomb, to yeah. get me. He did the opposite of what he was trying to do. See what I'm saying? Oh, I see what you're saying. Good. That's yeah. actually a good analogy. I'll give you credit for that one. Not yeah. saying that Matt is a mouse. I'm not saying that. <laughs> but I'm just saying, you know, conceptually. But he has the, the will and fortitude and the lessons. Yes. Most important. So the guy who to, made the bomb kind of screwed himself. Yeah. You know what I mean? In this big way. That's what and, I'm saying. Yeah. And it's, it's you know, kind of. It's hard to say that you just call me a mouse, but, or no, but it, you know, it's like at the end of the day, it's like, you know, I, I look back at you know, all together just being a Marine, you know, and never quit, never quit on my brothers and never quitting on the situation that's given to me. And I'll use, you know, the amputations and the blindness and all this stuff stacked against me as motivation, you know, and every now and then it like steers its ugly head. But, you know, thankfully for my wife, my family and you know, the mindset and mentality that I have right now and the friends that I've surrounded myself with that, you know, I kind of push it back and, you know, kick its butt. Yes, sir. Indeed. Speaking yes. of kicking butt. Yes. What do you got for We're us? on the path. Matt's on the path. He's been on the path. Matt, have you, tried jiu-jitsu, but have yeah. you ever tried jiu-jitsu yet? If you could teach a blind guy with no legs jiu-jitsu, then I'm all for it. Yes. Well, I've definitely taught blind guys jiu-jitsu, and oh, I've yeah. definitely taught guys with no legs jiu-jitsu. Well, let's put them together so now. So guess what? <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. I think you might find it easier than the baton death march. Yes, sir. Oh. You will. Yeah. yeah. No, man, you can definitely, you can train uh, jiu-jitsu all day long. Um, Ryan Job, you know, one of my guys who, who is blinded, and uh, I trained with him, and he, he wrestled too in high school so he had some background but yeah you can there's people that com- competitively um yeah that compete oh, yeah. with with no vision and the no legs thing well that you just learn jiu-jitsu is adaptable mm-hmm. yeah uh so you can you can adapt it as well, you as you are quite good at well you know my hashtag no legs no vision no problem so uh, <laughs> there you go anything like, anything out there i'll yeah. do it actually some jiu-jitsu training we used to do they you know they say close your eyes when yeah. you train, you start back to back. Yeah, and yeah. Closer. And the thing is, once you have have contact with a guy, yep. Like being able to see him isn't yep. that much of an I, advantage. I, I sometimes close my eyes just yeah, because. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. The thing with grappling is, you learn well. You learn to know what the other person's doing by feel, mm-hmm. and yeah, you don't really need because you can't see. What are you going to see anyways? You yeah. see like their armpit, yeah, yeah. or I mean, whatever. You see their, their, specific, their, yeah. yeah. So you don't get to see much anyways. Yeah. The friend I was telling you about that had shrapnel on his leg in Iraq, I, I got a video of him and I grappling. And it, it, it's harder because like I could put him in a headlock, but you know, my legs, I can't do much with that. But mm-hmm. they have a video of me like tapping him out because he's like bright, he bright red. <laughs> and yeah. it's like. And well, now a million people are going to want to see that video. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a funny he's video. He's going to be mad. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's the part you kind of miss is like the look of defeat. On, you know, on his yeah. face or whatever, but you, you know, have to imagine that. that part. Oh, I yeah. let him know the rest of the day, and then I also sent the picture to everybody that we served with. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see. it's out there. So, yeah, so you'll roll right into that's it. That's the jiu jitsu. Yeah. Yeah. That. And plus, you're a good athlete. You got them mm-hmm. tennis skills. No, oh, yeah. <laughs> my wife's gonna, things to use. My wife's gonna love that you said that. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yes, on the path, very good jiu jitsu. So, when you're doing jiu jitsu on this path that we're all on, by the way, you're gonna need a gi. You're going to want a gi if you do gi, which I recommend, by the yeah. way. 
Origin Gi. This is where you get your gis at. OriginMain.com. Gi, Rash Guard. There's other stuff on there. But as far as gis go, that's where you get them. All made in America, by the way, Jocko. Yeah. Yeah, that's the big thing. Yeah. So, little town up in Maine. And all the industry was taken away from this town. And um, we're bringing it back. We got a factory yep. up there. We got, I think we got, well, we got a bunch of people working in the factory. And they're all craftsmen. Craftsmen and craftswomen. Oh, yeah. craftspeople. Gotta throw that. Craftspeople. Oh, yeah. Is yeah. that yeah. right? Yeah. Because <laughs> a lot of them are female. Oh, yeah. um, and, you know, they're, they're making all this stuff. So it's great to see that. We're trying to make America make again. Did you just, is that just now? I, I shot that to Pete. <laughs> okay. Pete, okay. my brother Pete. I was like, hey, we're going to make America make again. Make again. Because that's, that's what we're trying to do, yeah, right? Man. We're trying to make America make Well, it's stuff. totally happening. I mean, we got, what, denim, American yeah, denim jeans. being made. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Not the kind that's the plans for the future, uh, no. which, are good, which is good, by the yeah, way. Plans for the future. Like good future plans. But, mm-hmm. but that's not a future plan. That's We like current. future plans, but we really like actual Current. this is happening yes. so bringing in denim production back. Yes. yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah man. America, yes. think about it american jeans were ma- were cr- created in america mm-hmm. created here invented here mm-hmm. and all of a sudden they're getting made overseas and these and, and there's no americans that are making them anymore well there are now yeah yeah, yeah there are now in a factory in farmington maine there oh yeah go. that's what yeah, we're man. doing so yes <laughs> originmaine.com go there gi rash guards denim Joggers, the all kinds of, of cool stuff. Yeah. And also supplements. supplements, of course. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. So I'm back. Oh, man, I twisted my knee out doing jujitsu. Yeah. Like the kind that popped out, popped back in. Yeah. They do that. They're skinny, yes, yeah. but they're loose too. <laughs> strangely, strangely. Actually, my knees are so loose. Again, with the knees, I know. But my knees are so loose that I um. I like sprained it one time, so I went to the orthopedic surgeon. You know, check it out. He was like, "Oh yeah, you blew your ACL." I was mm. like. Since I really did blow my ACL 10 to 12, to, like 15 years earlier, my mm. other side, I knew that my knees were loose because the guy, the doctor at that time was mm-hmm. like, hey, you have real, like, I don't know, long ligaments. I don't know. I know that sounds funny. <laughs> I have long ligaments. I know. But that's what he said. Yeah. Anyway, so I was like, hey. Are you sure he just didn't say you had skinny knees? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he says... Um, yeah, you have loose like ligaments or whatever, um, but this is how you know this one is blown out and this one is not. Because yep. when you pull it, the yep. one that's not blown out, boom, it has a tight like mm-hmm. cord at the end of it where it just stops. Anyway, so my current orthopedic surgeon, I told him that. He was like, okay, that's good that you told me that. So he tries the other one and like he's like, oh, yeah, they're the same. Like the, So it's probably not blown out, but hey, MRI anyway. <laughs> MRI, boom. Anyway, back to my story. So they pop out. Right, that's their thing. Mm. When I twist them wrong, they'll pop out. Sometimes they'll pop out so much that it'll like kind of make the cartilage swell on the outside. Okay. Mm. So it takes a few days so I, until I can bend them all away. And I'm pretty flexible, Jeez. by the way. Nonetheless, once I did that, double dose joint warfare and krill oil. Four days back in the game. That's that's quick. Yes. Mm. That's quick. Plus we got the uh, milk. Yes. Additional uh, protein. Yep. Additional protein. We got the discipline go, and the discipline, and we got the warrior kid mulk. I got to get you some warrior kid mulk for your kids, Matt. Toughen oh, yeah. them up, huh? So what it is 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 like. Do you do your kids like chocolate milk? They do. Do they like? Do you ever have strawberry chocolate? Well, what is that strawberry milk? Yeah. Do you ever have that one? My my Layla, seven year old, she loves strawberry milk. Okay. Yeah. So unfortunately. The milk, the strawberry milk that you have to give your kids is horrible for them, even though it tastes delicious. I guess, well, there is like some protein in it, right? There's some nutritional value because it does have some protein because there's milk in it. Yeah. But you're also ladening them with sugar, which is not good for them. No. Mm. And addictive, so, by the way. So, yeah. yeah, and it's addictive. So, we solved this problem and we made Warrior Kid Milk. It tastes delicious. I'm telling you, it tastes like. I don't know if I'm supposed to say this, but it tastes like the Nestle's Quick Strawberry Milk. You know what I'm talking oh, about? Yep. It tastes like it's that good. I'm not kidding. Layla will be all over this stuff. She will be stoked. Yeah, if they oh. like strawberry, yeah. that's, yeah. that's yeah. a really good one. So idea. we'll get you some of that. Well, thank and you. anyone else out there that wants to raise warrior kids that doesn't want to give your kid a bunch of actual poison, mm. sugar, yeah. actual poison. Well, yeah, and here's the thing about sugar too. And sure i read a little thing about this but i've noticed this so you know how like um 
when you're, they're like little babies or mm-hmm. whatever, you'll give them like, I don't know, all kinds of stuff. Right? And let's say you give them formula, but the formula is kind of sweetened, yeah. right? So it's like it's sweetened so they'll like it, so they'll eat it. Oh, yeah. But if you don't give them any sweet stuff, even when they grow up, they'll like, yeah, they'll they only they eat normal stuff, like yep. unsweetened stuff, you know? So I'll use myself as a small example. When I was young, <laughs> my parent, you know the, you know the like the fruit, not fruit punch, but like an orange juice concentrate. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When you make orange juice, you put orange juice concentrate, mm-hmm. and then you get um, water. Yes, yes, and you water. put it all in. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. But how you do it is you go. Um, it's like a twelve ounce concentrate. Right? Yeah, we'll okay. say, we'll say. I think it's twelve ounces. You put the concentrate in, and then you fill that same twelve ounce container. That the concentrate was in with water four times. Okay. Right? Little did I know it was really three times. That's how much you're supposed to. That's the recommended. But my mom always did the four times. She was trying to save money, too. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Um, Yeah, I'm sure that was part of it. That's what would have been my family. Well, (laughs) she was like, hey. I'd have been six in there. (laughs) (laughs) Nonetheless, I was used to it. I was totally used to it. So then later on when I found out in high school, by the way, that it was really uh, three? Yeah. I was like, bro, I can't do the three. It's way too sweet. Yeah, your mom. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Saved money and made you more healthy. Exactly. There, way to go, mama. <laughs> there you go. Way to Boom. go. The right path. Yeah. Yeah, yeah see? Yeah, Puts exactly you on the right, right. path for Amen. sure. So think about that. And when you think about that, think about this. Jocko has a store. It's called Jocko's Store. So when you're on the path, you want to represent while being on the path. That's where you go. You can get your t shirts. Discipline equals freedom. Good, good shirt. Oh, the, the new one on there. New, the new good shirt. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. With less More of simple. less of my head on it. Yeah, you know, like, <laughs> it is weird, especially after a while when, like, uh, you know, you look in the mirror and it's like, good, yeah, I get the message, but you got to see Jocko's face or whatever, and, you know, sometimes you're not in the mood for that. You just get the other one. Do you sell your t- T-shirts anywhere, Matt? They're on my website. Okay. Um, and uh, we're, we're in the process of getting, right now he's got the cotton shirts, but we're working on, you know, workout shirts as oh, okay. well. And, um, but yeah, and that's MatthewBradford.com? Matthew-Bradford.com. That's right. I was going I, I to correct myself. Matthew-Bradford.com. The yeah, there's, they're on there as well. And um, you can also go on there and request speaking engagements as well and book me. But yeah, but yeah the shirts are there and hashtag on the front of them. And the hashtag on the front is no vision, no legs, no problem. No legs, no vision, no problem. No legs, no oh, that's right. Problem. I had to prioritize. Yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's different. It's, yeah. it's, 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 it's hilarious hearing people um, just go after the hashtag. It's like no sight, no legs, no vision. Yeah, it's like yeah. no eyes. It's like, well, first of all, I got one eye at least. The other one's a prosthetic. But, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, you know, that's something I come up with like a couple years ago, like doing an event. And it's like, you know what? It just kind of stuck. And next thing you know, here we go. It's like, no yeah. legs, no vision, no problem. And those, uh, the workout shirts you're talking about, what do you, th- um, what, like a dry fit kind of situation or what? Kind of like a dry fit, but then also the Discipline Equals Freedom t-shirt, the what the material y'all use. Oh, yeah. That's like I, I really, I really blend. like that material because yeah. I feel like when I work out, I get good numbers and I got the Discipline Equals Freedom t-shirt on. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's yeah. a psychological, that's a psychological <laughs> action going on. A little, oh, yeah. little placebo. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's one of those things, right? It's like, what do you call it? Well, Armoring the, the, up? Wait, or let me ask you this. Pro- if the placebo is works, is it really a placebo? Because that's, you know, we could debate that later. Yeah. I don't want to do no, it right yeah. now. We want, Matt's <laughs> got to make, I don't want to Matt's whole vacation. Yes. So you're yes. talking yeah. about. We want to get somebody else in here for that one. Yeah. <laughs> Echo's going to start telling the story about, like, Kool-Aid or something, <laughs> <laughs> mixing it up, how much water goes in there. Anyway, maybe, maybe. <laughs> anyway, you want to represent on the path, jockostore.com. If you see something you like, get something. How's this? How's this? Yes, lightweight hoodies. Oh, they're in. Oh, I know. They're in. Them. They're up. They're representative of quality yeah. Little, little dash of fashion. All in I'm going to say is, see, Matt, you're probably down. So He's wearing be, a lightweight from, yeah, situation he's from, right now. He's living in Kentucky. Mm. Oh, yeah, know? exactly There's right. more often you're going to need that in Kentucky. But That's if you're in Maine, point. you're not going to need that lightweight mm-hmm. hoodie. hoodie. What? All right. Well, I'm going to the immersion camp. I'm going to bring one. I'm going to wear one. How about that? Immersion camp. Immersion, immersion yeah, camp. Yeah, the immersion camp. The origin immersion camp. We haven't talked about that because it's almost sold out. Go to OriginMain.com. I know. Go to OriginMain.com if you want to go to that uh, jujitsu camp. If you want to come to that mat, let me know. All right. When come is it again? Can, it's in August. All right. It's uh, it's fun. We do jujitsu, twenty four hours a day. And y'all did that last days. year as well too. Right? Yeah. 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 We did it. We rocked it. It was it's a good time. Uh, Jocko White T. You can get that as well. 
if you can't deadlift 8,000 pounds, you might want to order it quickly. Yes. Because if you drink Jocko White tea, there's a 100% scientific guarantee that you'll be able to deadlift a minimum yeah. of 8,000 pounds. Some people are coming in higher than that, which is fine. Yeah. Not a placebo <laughs> at all. No, no, it's 100%. Mm-hmm. Uh, subscribe. You can, you can subscribe to this podcast. Mm-hmm. Because Echo thinks that you've listened to 171 podcasts and maybe you haven't hit subscribe yet. Well, That's maybe, what Echo you know, thinks. Well, and unfortunately you know, for me, more Echo is proven right. There's more to it than that. No, Echo is proven right. Because then a bunch yeah. of people, when I made fun of you for that, mm-hmm. a bunch of people rallied to your defense. Yeah, so. man. Cause it's have real. you noticed it's that real. there's a whole little group that oh, will yeah. rally to your defense? You know why? Because I have a good point sometimes. Not sometimes. all the time. Not all the time. <laughs> I understand. I understand. What you did? Yes. Come on. No, uh, subscribe. Oh, also don't forget about the Warrior Kid podcast. We just released a couple more episodes. Yeah. Stories from Uncle Jake. Yeah, those stories are good, man. I love those so stories. Good. I'm going to publish a book with those stories, by the way. Mm-hmm. Good idea. Yes. Yeah, I know. It's a big shocker. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget the Warrior Kids Soap from Irish Oaks, Oaks Ranch. Actually, it's not for kids. It's soap made by a kid, but it's not for kids. Right, right. It's for yeah. humans in general yeah. that need to stay clean. Stay clean, yes. Also, YouTube, if you are interested in the video version of this podcast... You want to see what Matt looks like? Yeah. Oh boy! Yeah. You want to see what Jocko looks like <laughs> if you don't know already. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I was explaining to Matt. I'll explain to everyone. As mm-hmm. everyone knows, Echo does not sound like he looks like. You know, we all know that Echo sounds. Just I'm just gonna say it. Echo sounds skinny and weak. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. For that. No problem. I don't mean that in a bad way. Oh, yeah. no, 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 no. Hey, no offense, but Echo sounds. St- My kids always make fun of that. <laughs> this, the hey, no offense, but. Right, you, I'm, I'm going to say something very yeah, offensive. Say completely. Yeah. So I was explaining to Matt. I'm like, listen, bro, <laughs> most people, when they see Echo and they meet him, they go, oh, okay, cool. He's not really. They think to themselves, oh, he's not. He doesn't look like the way he sounds. Yeah. So I had to say, Matt. I know you can't see Echo, but he doesn't look the way he sounds. <laughs> Matt was like, "Okay, cool, thanks." Because <laughs> otherwise, he, no, he's a, you know he might have said something like, "You know, maybe if you're trying to put on weight, like maybe Echo needs to." Oh right, just yeah, by the yeah, sound like, of your voice, yeah. it sounds like you maybe need to do some squats. <laughs> <laughs> When I was in the hospital, I had like a color. That every time I would make fun of somebody, then they would be in the room and I didn't know that. Then they'd be like, blue, blue, blue. Oh. It's like, <laughs> it's like get my mind off of like what I was going to say. And like, oh, okay. Why are you saying the color right now? <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah, that is good, actually. That's so, good yeah, the YouTube videos. There's also Echoes Enhanced YouTube videos. I just put one up today. Yep. What up? Actually, technically, okay. it would be cool. what? Yesterday, Monday. Monday. Yesterday. Those are good. Uh, check out flipsidecanvas.com. That's a little company by my brother, Dakota Meyer. Mm-hmm. He's making uh, cool things to hang on your wall. Yeah. Of highest quality, made in America. He made one that says good. Yeah. If cool. that's a message that, you, that resonates with you, mm. you can do that. Uh, he's got one that says discipline equals freedom. And by the way, I didn't really know this until the other day, mm-hmm. and I hate to even do this because uh, Dakota might get mad at me, mm-hmm. but he kind of takes requests. <laughs> <laughs> so if you heard something on this yeah. podcast and you mm-hmm. say to yourself, dang, when, when Matt Bradford said this, mm-hmm. when Matt Bradford said, just walk, I mean, yeah. can that not become, that can be, that's yeah. like something you'd kind of want to put on your wall, right? Uh, yeah. Just walk, yeah. boom. <laughs> yeah. So, if there's something like that, hit up Dakota on Twitter and say, hey, Dakota, wouldn't it be cool if there was a a, a canvas that said, just walk? He's, he might have to put like a request like, uh, section Thread like on his or website something. or something like this <laughs> yeah. to filter that one out. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, that, there's some good stuff on there. I, I went yeah. through it and was like looking at it. I was yeah. like, ah, oh, this is good, man. Mm. And I'm not really an artsy guy as far as hanging art on the wall. You ever been in a hotel? Yeah, yeah, It has yeah. like mm-hmm. a picture of like a cabin, you know? And I see what yep, they yep. were doing. Yep. They were trying to make you feel cozy, but it's like, bro, this is a random picture of a cabin <laughs> on this thing, and I don't know. But yeah, you get that, that good one that, that we have that he has. Yeah, I was like, oh, okay, I can yeah. kind of get down with this, even just the looks alone. For sure. And then you yeah. got the, another layer, the good Vis- and all that. Aesthetically pleasing. Yeah, it was good. And there's layers. And layers, exactly right. We haven't talked about layers in quite some time. <laughs> you <laughs> used the layer talk, there, didn't you? No, I think you did, <laughs> but, you know, hey, man, it's probably my fault. Also, Psychological Warfare. If you don't know what that is, it's an album with tracks of Jocko getting you, getting us 
getting all of us through our moments of weakness, whatever they may be. So check out that one. That's on like an Amazon MP3 spot where you get MP3s. You understand. Yep. iTunes, all that stuff. That's where you get it. It's really good. Also, on it. So if you're expanding your home gym still, which we all are, that's an ongoing thing I understand, get your kettlebells, rings. What else? These maces and clubs, really good for your creative type workouts. Unless you unless you want to keep a boring workout like Jocka. I mean, that's it's up to you. How creative are your workouts, Matt? <laughs> uh, You'd like to do the same thing? Do you vary it up all the time? I got things I like going back to. Like I love doing bench press and um, pull ups and dips, but I do like changing it up every now and then. But you were talking big time about the chains. I love chains. That's I love, kinda, it's kind of like legit isn't it yeah and it, yeah it's, it's kind of dope like looking to when one like while you're working out with them but what that does it offers this kind of offsetting like weight right. to you and to what you're doing and it's yeah it's good especially when Those you change you do my pull-ups too chains yeah. are hard they, oh um, yeah but yeah i love love making my workouts even harder than it really is yeah yeah that's all right that's use the, the weight use the yeah. weight like rob, rob jones says sure. boom but yeah that's where you go on it.com actually you know what here how's this the perfect mix morning mix or pre-workout mix like before jujitsu be, so on it has these uh it's their minerals or electrolyte minerals mm -hmm. mix that two scoops of discipline mm -hmm. water and if you know I put a five hour energy every once in a while when I want to like a boost or whatever, but all you need those minerals, the discipline, water, and oh, that's when you take like your krill oil and all that stuff. Boom. Perfect mix. Interesting. Yeah. Try that okay. one. Hey, I, I, I got a bunch of books too. That's true. Mikey and the Dragons. I got these books. I brought these up for your kids too, uh, Matt. No. Mikey and the Dragons, little kid's book, lessons for everyone, Way the Warrior Kid, and Mark's mission, those are for like kids that want to be on the path. And there's a new one coming out. It's called Where There's a Will. Yeah. Dot, dot, dot. That's what it's called. Discipline equals freedom field manual. If you want the audio of that, it's also on Amazon, Google Play, iTunes, MP3 platforms. Extreme Ownership, first book I wrote with my brother Leif Babin. Follow up to that is the dichotomy of leadership. We got Echelon Front, which is leadership consultancy and what we do is work with businesses to solve problems through leadership. Go to echelonfront.com for details. We got the muster coming up May 23rd and 24th in Chicago, September 19th and 20th in Denver, and December 4th and 5th in Sydney. You came to the muster, Matt. I did last year in um, Washington, D.C. Really, How'd you like it? I loved it. I loved going there, and thank you and Leif for inviting me to, to join you all. It was awesome to have you there. Did you relate or did you recognize the leadership lessons? It's amazing, like, like, cause you don't think about it too much, but you know, it's, it's different terminology, but it all means the same. And I, I love how like prioritize and execute and all this stuff, you know, going back to the military side <laughs> of it and it, it kind of keeps you back in the fight a little bit. And so I, I do go back to work and like, all right, this is how you should lead, <laughs> you know? And, you know, it, it's weird too. I. I was, um, I always think about leadership. It's always in my head. And I always think about military stuff. And actually, I was listening to you uh, talk about getting blown up. And you were talking about how you guys had good dispersion. Mm -hmm. And what that means is you're separate from each other. That way, if something blows up or you get hit with a mortar or even machine gun fire, if everyone's too close together, then you get multiple wounded. So you mm -hmm. have to. You have to have spacing. Now, obviously, there's a dichotomy because if you have too much spacing, then you can't see each other, you can't help each other, you can't get to each other, and you can't communicate with each other. So there's a dichotomy. But we used to use this real simple corrective statement. And it's real simple. Don't bunch up. Mm -hmm. Don't bunch up. Don't bunch up. Like, if you see guys patrolling, and they like one guy hits a little bit of an obstacle, and so it takes him a, a couple extra seconds to get over. You fast forward that times eight guys, and all of a sudden there's five guys sitting on yeah. this obstacle. They're trying to get through it. Mm -hmm. hey, guess where the enemy puts a landmine? They put it by that obstacle because they know you're going to get bunched up. Huh. You're in a gunfight, and you see got, there's a, a little piece of cover, or sometimes there's not even cover, but everyone just you get the instincts that yeah. if we're closer, we're we're safer. We're safer. Yeah, yeah. And so you, I would when I was running training, I always be saying, "Don't bunch up. Don't bunch up." Now, how does that apply to leadership? I can, ex it hit me the other day as I was working out, as a matter of fact. Don't bunch jump on leadership. What does that mean? That means 
if you're leading Echo, mm-hmm. I need to let you lead. I don't need to come in there and lead too. I don't oh, yeah. need to get right up and bunch up mm-hmm. on you. Yeah. The, so when someone st- steps up and takes leadership, don't bunch up. Yeah. Man, let him give him some space. Yeah. Let him move and follow him. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. Mm-hmm. So these things that I learned in the military, that Matt learned in the military, when you when you look at them from a leadership perspective outside the military, they still apply. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So if you want to learn about some of that stuff, come to the muster. Um, extremeownership.com for details. EF online. Maybe you can't come to the muster. Maybe you're too busy. Maybe you don't have that much money right. Maybe you can't get the time off. Maybe you can't travel that far. There's a bunch of reasons. And we know that. And we don't like that. No, we don't. So what, what we did is we made EF online. It is online interactive leadership training. It's it's me and the rest of the Echelon Front team showing you, teaching you about the principles of leadership that we learned in combat, and it's available right now. If you want to go check it out, efonline.com. And finally, we've got EF Overwatch, which is us connecting leaders from the military, from special operations, from combat aviation, and we're connecting them with companies in the civilian sector that need leaders. And this is one thing I've started to say is when people, people always ask, oh, I wanna hire the right person, how do I do it? Hire the leader. You wanna hire somebody that has experience as a leader. You don't, just because someone is good at some technical thing doesn't mean that they're gonna be good at leadership. It yeah. doesn't work that way. Yeah. So you, it's better to hire somebody that has leadership capability rather than, and, t- and then you take that person that has leadership capability and you teach them what they need to know about the industry that you're in. So you could have somebody that was in the, the special forces and you say, oh, I'm gonna hire him to run this communications sales group. He doesn't know anything about communication sales group. I'll tell you what though, you give him like a month and a half, digging in deep, he'll learn everything he's gotta know and he's gonna apply the leadership things that he knows from his military service into that position and he's gonna win. Mm. He's gonna make it happen. Yeah, and what I realize that it's not to be confused with boss. Like lead, when you say a, people with leadership experience, yeah, not for sure. boss. Not, they, they won't yeah. roll in and be like, I'm the boss now since I was no. the special force. You know, no, 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 it's no. not that. Because like, they're humble. Because yeah. we're only bringing people in through EF, f- through EF Overwatch. We're only bringing people in that understand the principles that we talk about in extreme ownership, yeah. which none of that has to do with being a boss. Yeah, I have a thing where I annoy my wife I, often. I can, I can understand, <laughs> yes. yes sir. One of the most annoying things that I can do to her is I'll act like I'm not listening to anyone. No one can have any influence on me whatsoever. And so she had some conference <laughs> thing that I was supposed to go to, sure. and sure. she's sending me these you, you know, she's sending me like, "Hey, we're supposed to be there at six o'clock." I'm like, I'm, "I'll show up when I want to." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then, and then my little daughter, she always takes my wife's side because she hasn't sure. quite figured out my sense of humor yet. Uh-huh. And so my daughter was like, "Dad, you need to do what mom says. You need to go." When you know, she said six o'clock, and I was like, "They're not the boss of me." <laughs> <laughs> so my little daughter was all mad at me mm-hmm. for a little while, and then she realized I was joking. Now she goes, "Dad's not serious." <laughs> <laughs> she figured it out. Yeah, dad's yeah, not serious. He's kidding. Yeah. And now, now I've gone too far yeah. where, you know, I'm like, clean your room. She's like, oh, you're just kidding. Yeah. Uh, actually, I'm not. Joke's on you now, man. Uh, yep. Joke's on you. Um, so, hey, if you want to hang around with us a little bit more, you can find all of us virtually on the interwebs. So, Matt is, you already hear his website, Matthew dash, or Matthew hyphen. Bradford, I think that's right. Ma- Matthew. Oh, and there's also two T's. Is that a thing? Is there two ways to spell Matthew, or am I just dumb? Um, uh, well, does it always have two T's? That's the common way. Okay, we'll say, cool, you cool. know, it, yeah. I won't. I won't emphasize it. Then I thought I had yeah. to emphasize that there was two T's in there. <laughs> yeah. So Matthew hyphen Bradford dot com is where you can check out Matt for T shirts for booking him as a speaker for seeing what he's up to. He's also Bionic Matt 5, number 5, Bionic, 
spelled wrong with a K. With a K. Yeah, well, I, I wanted to be young and hip when I created it. No, for sure. Handle, no, that yeah. that, that yeah. screams young and hip. Yeah. 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 <laughs> for sure. Yeah, hell yeah. I'm getting uh, up there in age. I got to keep young, you know. Yeah. So and and Matt's posting all. Oh, if you if you want to if you're feeling sorry for yourself at all, check out and and follow Bionic, spelled with a K. Matt, number five. What's the number five for? That was my football number. Yeah. There you yeah. go. And, and, and uh, if you want to think about it, graduate high school in 05. So yeah. oh, all just kinds layers. of layers. Yeah, layers yeah, you know, there's, those right there. <laughs> and there's also, uh, I did, my wife just created it here recently too, a new Facebook public page, No Legs, No Vision, No Problem too. So oh, okay. we, we've been kind of posting stuff on what we're doing and also kind of um, – yeah, other you know amputees and stuff like that so. and also since you're young and hip you also have your gram your instagram oh, yeah. don't forget about your instagram well the the funny thing with that is people amanda's like oh, if you want to get your name out there you need an instagram account I'm like i'm blind i don't need to look at pictures <laughs> so she was like she was like okay well i'll run your instagram account so when people yell at me and it's like how come you don't follow me on instagram it's like well you need to go talk to my no, wife dude. on that one there, here's, so. here's what you need to do the next 10 posts you put on instagram all black yeah. just all black and be like hey what up matt bradford here can you see what i'm talking about that's what i thought look at this beautiful view of the yes. ocean right yes. here yeah. i'm in california doesn't it look nice hey get off your ass and go do something oh i'm back in kentucky look it's it's the fall the, 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 the or it's the springtime here comes the green grass this is what it looks like to me okay now get a grip on reality get out there and live your lives uh, so you got to do that I'll talk to Amanda. Let's Actually, hopefully I can get her on board with the program. <laughs> She'll be all for that. No, one that'll there. be awesome. Yeah. We'll make it go viral. <laughs> uh, just learned that expression. Which way. part? The viral part. The viral, like <laughs> make it go viral. Uh-huh. Okay, and then that for your for your for your Instagram page is m underscore Bradford underscore USMC. I'm glad you got that down. Cause yeah. Oh, I wrote it down. Oh, because okay. when I found it, I was like, "Cool, I'm going to put out the word, and then I'm going to tell you to post a bunch of black pictures." <laughs> <laughs> and then on that, and so the public, what was the public uh, Facebook again? It's just no legs, no vision, no problem. Awesome. And of course, on all those platforms, Echo is at Echo Charles, and I am at Jocko Willink. Echo, you got anything else? No, sir. Thank you, Matt. Great to meet you. Thank you so much, Echo. It's nice meeting you too. Any any uh, closing thoughts, Matt? I just uh, really appreciate Jocko, you all having me on your podcast, and you know the the friendship that we started last May. You know, I look forward to it continuing in the future and stuff. And you know, for everybody out there listening, you know, when when life gets tough, just remember that one day at a time, and you put your head down and close your eyes, and the next day will will be over, or the the old day will be over, and the new day will be there. So. Just push on, better yourself, go to the gym, work out, love life, and enjoy everything that we have to offer here in the United States. Awesome, man. And uh, thanks to everyone that has served and is serving in our military. And I started off this podcast by reading the oath that you all swore to defend us. So thank you all out there in our military for taking and keeping that oath. And obviously, Matt, Thank you so much for taking that oath, for taking that oath twice, for keeping that oath despite everything that had been put in front of you. Thank you for your service and your sacrifice, and thanks for coming to talk to us. Also, police and law enforcement, firefighters, paramedics, EMTs, correctional officers, border patrol, first responders, and that includes dispatchers that are staying calm on the phone, on the radio, to get people the help that they need when they need it. Thanks to all of you for protecting us as well. We owe you all a debt of gratitude. And to everyone else that's listening, I'm gonna take a quote from Matt Bradford's Twitter. And it says this, to walk this earth blind is not the same as having no vision. To walk by faith, unchanged by the hand dealt is to live life as a visionary and to love life as humans were meant seek never settle inspire never complain rise never stay down no legs no vision no problem and let's face it 
if Matt Bradford can do what he does, if he can keep pushing and keep driving and keep finding new missions and successfully executing those missions, if he can wake up every day and say, no legs, no vision, no problem, if he can have the vision he has and the heart that he has, then all of us can stop complaining and we can go get after it. And until next time, this is Matt and Echo and Jocko out.